All praises to the Most High. So tonight's topic, we are continuing on on the, the seven stages of repentance of being born again. Okay, so we dealt with the spiritual aspect, we dealt with the health aspect, we dealt with the social one, with the social aspect, we dealt with the work aspect. Now today we're gonna deal with the financial aspect of as part of your journey of repentance, financial health, financial health. That's part of your journey of being born again. That's part of your journey of repentance, okay? Let's open up with the book of Proverbs, chapter six. Proverbs six, verse six, let's start there. The book of Proverbs, chapter six, verse six. Go Go ahead. to the end, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Read again. The book of Proverbs, chapter six, verse six. Go to the end, thou sluggard. Consider our ways and be wise. So now the Lord is commanding us, uh, we must go to the end and consider the ways of the end because the Lord is saying we are sluggard. You understand? So we must go to the end and learn some wisdom. That's what the Lord is saying right there. So the question is, what is a sluggard? Let's get the definition of a sluggard, okay? Let's get the definition of a sluggard. Give me one second. Let me share my screen real quick so we can see what is the definition of a sluggard. Okay, read that. Sluggard. Come on. The definition of the word sluggard. Mm -hmm. Sluggard. Noun. A lazy and sluggish person. He says a lazy, sluggish person. A lazy, sluggish person. That's a sluggard. Read that again. Proverbs 6 verse 6. The book of Proverbs, chapter 6, verse 6. Go ahead. Go to the end, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. He says, go, go to the end, you lazy bum. You understand? You sluggish person. He says, go to the end, you lazy bum. Consider her ways and be wise. So the Lord had to really use carnal things to explain, to get, to get, to get our attention. Because as a people... We've, 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 we've fallen so low that the Lord said, you know what? I have to use the end to wake them up. I have to use the end as an example for them to what? To labor. That's what the Lord is saying, right? That's an insult right there. But the Lord says, go to the end and learn how the end moves. Okay, go ahead. Verse seven, read. Which having no guide, overseer or ruler. He says, the end has no guide, overseer or ruler. Go ahead. Provided the meat in the summer mm -hmm. and gather the food in the harvest. So now it says the end, meaning what? When is verse, verse 7, when is read verse 7 again. Watch this. The book of Proverbs, chapter 6, verse 7. Read. Which having no guide, overseer, or ruler. Meaning what? The end does not need to be told what to do. Meaning what? No, not that the end doesn't know what doesn't want to be told. The end knows what needs to get done. That's the point. The end, you, the end, the Lord has put the spirit in the end to do what he's supposed to. Just like he, they put the spirit upon us to keep his laws, to run this earth. But we rejected that because we became rebellious. Now he says, go to the end and see how the end moves, how progress gets done. That's what he's saying right there. Okay, reverse eight now again. The book of Proverbs chapter six, verse eight. Provideth the meat in the summer and mm -hmm. gathereth the food in the harvest. That's the key right there. He says, The ants provided her meat in the summer and gathered her food in the harvest. So, guess what? The, the ant will gather food. You understand? During harvest season, to gather all the food so that the ant will survive through the winter. Then, the summer, the, the summer comes, the ant always has food. Doesn't matter which season it is, the ant always has food. Because the end prepares. You understand? So the Lord says, we must get into the habit of doing the preparation. You understand? Planning. Strategizing. And the strategies and the plans and the, and the techniques, they are written in this book. You understand? Watch this. Give me Proverbs 30 verse 24. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 24. Read that. The book of Proverbs, chapter 13, verses 24. 
There be four Come things on. which are little upon the earth. Come on. But they are exceeding wise. He says, there are four things that are little upon earth. He says, but they are exceeding wise. Next verse. Go ahead. The ants are a people not strong. Mm -hmm. Yet they prepare their meat in the summer. You see that? He says, the ants are a people not strong. You understand? Yet they prepare their meat in the summer. Because one ant by itself will not be able to get anything done. One end by itself will not be able to accomplish anything because the end work, they work well in a colony. They work well as a unit. That's what the Lord is teaching us. You understand? We must let, we must, we learn unity. He says, look at the end. Look how the end moves. The end knows how to work well together with other ends. You understand? They know how to prepare. And in order for them to operate as a well oil machine is because there's order. There's no bickering back, going back and forth. You understand? They, all the individual ends as a unit, they all know what needs to get done. You see what he's saying? That's what the Lord is teaching us right there with the end. Read again, verse 25. The book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 25. The ends Read. are a people, not strong. Come on. Yet they prepare their meat in the summer. Yet they prepare their meat in the summer. Okay, now go back. Go back to Proverbs 6 now. Proverbs 6 and verse 9. Come on. The book of Proverbs, chapter 6, verse 9. Read. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? Mm -hmm. When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? You see what he's saying? Because remember, a sluggard is a, la is a lazy bum. That's what a sluggard is. Okay. A sluggard is a lazy bum. Read again verse 9. The book of Proverbs, chapter 6, verse 9. How yeah. long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? Mm -hmm. When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? When are you going to arise out of your sleep? When are you going to when are you going to stop putting your hands in your pocket and actually bend the elbows and get work done to push the work of the Lord? You understand? That's the question. Read on. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber. A little folding of the hands to sleep. You see that? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. You fold in the hand because you don't want to get nothing done. You lazy. That's what the Lord is saying to us. He says, we lazy. If you want to see some heavy insults, just read the Bible. The most I got some heavy insults for us. You understand? Because why? The Lord is, I give you, I give you the greatest book and knowledge on earth. But you're still playing games with it. That's what he's saying right there. So he says, because you dumb as hell, because you your, your intelligence is below the ground, is a no problem. Go to the end and learn how the end moves. That's what he's saying. You understand? So we each need to examine ourselves in terms of our what our, our work that we do, we put in this in this truth. You understand the way we think, how we conduct ourselves, you understand the way we look at things according to the scriptures. We need to relook at that. All of us we need to do self-examination. You understand? Read again. Verse 10. Come on. The book of Proverbs, chapter 6, verse 10. Mm -hmm. It's a little slip. It's a little sleep. A little slumber. A little Great. folding of the hand to sleep. Now watch this. Give me that in Sarah 22. Because a sluggard, the one that's fall, they, they fold their hands to sleep, this is what the Lord says about that. Give me that in Sarah 22, verse 1 and 2. Read that. The book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 22, verse 1. Read. A slothful man is compared to a filthy stone. Mm -hmm. And everyone will hiss him out to his disgrace. You see that? A slothful man. Listen, look, it's even written in, 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 in caps. The Mosa is emphasizing this thing. You understand? Is it a slothful man is written in caps. It says it's compared to a filthy slow a stone. That's a pile of doom. Okay, read on. Verse 2. Go ahead. A slothful man is compared to a filth of a dung here. Mm -hmm. Every man that takes it up will shake his hand. You see that? Every man that takes it up will shake his hand. Why? Because, because you are lazy. When you are called to come and get the work done, 
you are going to fold your hands. You are going to complain. You understand? So that's why he says, every man that takes it up will shake his hand, meaning what? Listen, where did I get myself into here? Okay, that's what the Lord is saying right there with us. So we each need to consider our ways. We need to think about the amount of work that we need to put in in this truth. That goes to your what? Your spiritual life. You understand? Your health, your social life, your work life. Okay? Your financial life, which is what we're dealing with this day. Okay? Give me Proverbs. Okay? Give me Proverbs chapter 22, verse 29. Watch this. The most I go throughout the Bible, it keeps dealing with the slothfulness of Israel. Because the Lord says we, we, we slothful. So we need to what? We need to get our minds right. Read. The book of Proverbs chapter 22, verse 29. Go ahead. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? Mm -hmm. He shall stand before kings. Come on. He shall not stand before mean men. You see what he's saying? He says, seest thou a man diligent in his business? Whose business? The Lord's business. We must be diligent in the Lord's business. Okay? He says, he shall stand before kings. We are diligent in the Lord's business. We're going to stand before kings because the... Christ is the king of kings. We the kings, but we must be diligent in the Lord's business. If we're not diligent before the Lord's been in the Lord's business, it says what? It says he shall stand before mean men. Meaning what? You're going to find yourself in the midst of bumps. That's what he's saying right there. You understand? Give me that in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 11. Romans 12, verse 11. Read that for me. Come on. The book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 11. Read. Not thoughtful in business. Mm -hmm. Fevent in spirit, serving well, the Lord. You see that? He says, we must, need, we must not be slothful in business. That's why it says, go to the end and see how progress gets done. You see that thing? He says, we must, be, we must not be slothful in business. That's why he says, we must what? Seest thou a man diligent in his business? In the Lord's business, we must be diligent. So we must be fervent in the spirit. We must serve the Lord. You understand? That's what the Lord is saying right there. Give me 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Read that. Come on. First book of Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 58. Read. Right. Therefore, my beloved brethren, mm -hmm. be ye steadfast, Come unmovable, mm -hmm. always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You see what he's saying? He says, we must always abound in the work of the Lord. For as much as we know, that our labor is not in vain in the law. Our labor is not in vain. We have to be diligent in the law's business, though, so that we can stand before kings when the Lord returns. You understand? So which means what? We must hold each other accountable to get this work done. Understand that thing. Watch this. Go back to Proverbs now. Proverbs 6. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 10 again. The book of Proverbs chapter 6, verse 10. Go Yet ahead. a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. You see that thing? So the law says we mustn't be sluggard. We must, we must not be slumbering when it comes to this truth. That's why he's using the end as an example for us to get our minds right. Next verse. Watch this. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. You see what he's saying? Is it because if we are slumbering, if we're lazy, you understand, we make excuses why the work is not getting done. The Lord is saying to us right there, says, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveled. Meaning a man that's, that's the one that, the, the one that, the, the man that's traveling, okay, he says, your poverty is going to come like that. And thy want, meaning your lack as an armed man, because the person that is armed, what are they, they going to do? They're going to rob you. So it says it, your poverty is going to be like that. So in order for us not to have that, jump back up, read verse 7 and 8 together, okay? Read 7 and 8 in order for us to do what? 
so that verse 11 does not happen to us. Okay, read what you got. Come on. The book of Proverbs, chapter 6, verse 7. Great. Which have no guide, overseer, or ruler. Great. Provided her meat in the summer and gathered her food in the harvest. You see that thing? So the end knows how to plan. The Lord says we must be like that. We must know how to we must know how to plan so that what? Read verse 11 again. The book of Proverbs chapter 6, verse 11. Right. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. You see that thing? It says, if we don't do that, if you don't apply verse 7 and 8, it says our poverty is gonna come as one that traveleth and our want as an armed man. So in order for us to prevent that, guess what we must do? We must learn how to budget. We must learn how to put a proper budget together, you understand, and be realistic with our budget too. We're going to go over that because I need to deal with that because that's something that I'm dealing with. You understand? So we all need to sit down and do a proper budget. You understand? We all need to do that because that's one of the biggest diseases in Israel. We don't budget nothing. You understand? We don't budget. The little that we have, we don't, it doesn't matter whether it be small or big, you understand? We don't budget nothing. So today we're going to learn not to do that. We're going to learn that we must budget because that's the law of God. Watch this. Give me the book of Sirach 11 verse 14. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 14. Watch this. Sirach 11 verse 14. Because poverty Riches and all that, they come from the Mosa. You understand? Watch this. Read that. Sirach 11, verse 14. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 11, verse 14. Wait. Prosperity and adversity. Mm -hmm. Life and death. Where? Poverty and riches come from the Lord. What? Poverty and riches come of the Lord. Poverty. Poverty and riches come of the law. Poverty and riches come of the law. So being impoverished is because the Lord has made, he put us into this position because we broke his commandments. Riches also. The reason why we as a nation we had riches is because of, it was because of the law. So both the rich, the riches and the poverty is because of what is because of the most High God. Okay. So when we, when we get the riches or when we in poverty, we get the, the, the crumb that fell that fall from the master's table, meaning what? You, we, our salaries that we get end of the month. You understand? The Lord is teaching us, is saying to us, listen, with the little that you get from the, the salaries that we get paid every month, you understand, from our labors and so forth, the Lord is teaching us that we must be able to sit down and do a proper budget so that we can know where the money is going. Where do we, where, where do we spend our money on? You understand? The most I wants us to do that. Watch this. Give me the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 12. Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, and verse 12. Watch this. Okay, come on. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 12. Great. Right. For wisdom is a defense. Come on. And money is a defense. Stop right there. It says wisdom is a defense. And money is a defense. Wisdom is a defense against evil. Money is a defense against poverty. That's what the Lord is saying right there. So don't be listening to a same telling you, no, no, we can live on love. That's a fool right there. Don't listen to that wicked nigga. Okay, read again, verse 12. The book of Ecclesiastes. Sorry, sorry I lost my page. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 12. I need you to pay attention. Come on. The book of Ecclesiastes 7, verse 12. For wisdom is a defense, mm -hmm. and money is a defense. Go ahead. But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom gives life to them that have it. You see what he's saying? He says, but the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. Because remember, the first stage of being born again, of repentance, we dealt with your spiritual life, meaning you must get your mind right. You understand? Once you get your mind right, guess what the Lord will give you? Give me Nehemiah 8 and 8. We coming back here. Nehemiah 8, verse 8. Okay. Watch this. Nehemiah 8, verse 8. Nehemiah 
Let's get there. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 8. The book of Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 8. Go ahead. So they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave Wait. the sin. What did they do? And gave the sins. So out of the book of the law distinctly, we give the sense. The Lord is going to give us the sense. You understand? Because without God's commandments, we have no sense. We're like a broken vessel that cannot hold no knowledge. Because we need God's commandments to do what? To give us sense. To be sensible. To make sensible decisions. Because right now, we're making senseless decisions. Why? Because we're not making an effort to apply God's laws to our lives. Okay? Read again. The book of it, the book of Nehemiah, chapter eight, verse eight. Read. So they read in the book in the law of God distinctly, and mm. gave the same, and gave the same. Read. And caused them to understand the reading. They did what? And caused them to understand the reading. And caused them to understand the things that are written there. Okay. Now let's go back. Go back to Ecclesiastes now, chapter 7, verse 12 again. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 12. Go ahead. For wisdom is a defense, mm -hmm. and money is a defense. And what? But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom oh, no. giveth oh, life to them. Read the verse again. Read the verse again. Yes, sir. Excuse Come me, sir. On. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 12. Go ahead. For wisdom is a defense, mm -hmm. and money is a defense. But right. the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. You see that? So when you come into the truth, you first need to get your mind right, meaning your spirit must be right with the law. You must be transformed. You must be turned into that new man or that new woman. You must be born again by the word of God. You understand? And the word of God will give you sense to know, okay, we need to deal with budget. You understand? Individual budget. You need to be able to, every month when you get paid, you have to sit down and do your financials. You understand? We need to sit down and do your financial, each and every one of us, whether married or not, men and women in this truth, we need to sit down and do our financials, okay? We'll look around to find a proper spreadsheet you understand? That's already been calculated in. The formulas are put together. And then we're going to put that thing. We're going to send it to everyone. And then you're going to use that to do your what? Your budgeting monthly. Okay? So you can see the money flow. You can see where you spend your money on. You understand? And we, I'm going to break this down so you, you know how to deal with that. Okay? That helps me as well. Okay, watch this. Now, give me, give me the book of Matthew. Okay? Give me Matthew 20 verse 2. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 2. Okay, give me Matthew 20 verse 2. The book of Matthew chapter 20 verse 2. Go ahead. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, mm -hmm. he sent them into, the, into his vineyard. Read that again. This is Christ now. This is a parable. Okay, read. In, of the, the laborers, of which is Israel. This is a parable of the laborers, which is Israel. The vineyard is Israel. Go ahead. The book of Matthew, chapter 20, verse 2. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, mm -hmm. he sent them into his vineyard. You see what the Lord did? He says, when he agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Jump down to verse 9. Now, so verse 2 is explaining that we are making an agreement to do the work for a what? For a payment that we're going to receive after the work is done. Okay, jump down to verse 9. Watch this. Come on. The book of Matthew, chapter 20, verse 9. And when they and when they came that were hired about the 11th hour, they received every man a penny. You see that? Read that again. I need you to put some power in your reading. Come on. Verse 9 again. The book of Matthew, chapter 20, verse 9. Wait. And when they came, that were hired about the 11th hour, they received every man a penny. You see what he's saying? He says, when they came, he says, when they came that were hired, those that were hired in verse two, he says, about the 11th hour, they
they receive every man a penny. Meaning what? Your wages. Okay? The payment. Your salary. So now, remember we read in Ecclesiastes 7, it says money is a defense. You understand? Because we labor, and then after you labor monthly, we get paid every month. So likewise, what we're reading in the book of Matthew, that's the same thing going on. You understand? So we labor, we're going to get our reward when the Lord returns. Likewise, every month we labor and guess we get paid from our respective jobs that we work at. You understand? So on and so forth. So guess what? Once you receive it, guess what you must do? Give me Sirach 42 verse 7. Once you receive those funds, those arms, here's what you must do with them. Okay, Sirach 42 verse 7. Watch this. Read that. The book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 42, verse 7. Read. Deliver all things in number and weight. No, no, deliver some things. Deliver all things in number and yeah. weight. It is deliver all things, all things in number and weight. Read. And put all in writing that thou givest out or uh -huh. receivest in. You see what he's saying? It says we must deliver all things in number and weight and put all in writing. So you must write down. So your salary comes down. You understand? You have a spreadsheet. The spreadsheet is ready. Once your salary comes in, guess what? Now you punch in the numbers. Then you start to do your budget monthly. You understand? So it's something that you have to work on it every month. So every two weeks, you must revisit your budget. But whenever you go to the shops and buy, whatever it is that you are doing, guess what? You must come, when you come back home, you sit down, you must put it in the budget. Or okay, today, this is what I spent. This is how much I spent and I spent it on this. You understand? So by the end, the time the month is done, you sit down, you do a review of your financials to see, okay, where's the money going? Okay, what am I spending money on? Where is my biggest problem in terms of my spending? Because that's where the, the question must come from. Because your budget dictates your spending. You understand? And when you do your spending, you must be able to see whether is this a need or is this a want. But your budget will dictate that. Once you, you have a budget, you're going to be able to know what to spend on. And whatever you're spending, what is it? Is it a need or is it a want? You understand? That must all be in your mind, whatever transaction you're doing. Read again. Verse 7. Come on. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 42, verse 7. Go ahead. Deliver all things in number and weight. Mm -hmm. And put all in writing. And thou givest out or receivest in. You see what he's saying? He says, you must put all in writing that thou givest out. Meaning you go out, whether you send money to somebody, whether you go to the shops and buy and so forth, as is what you receive as in. That will be your salary that comes in. You understand? So that salary that comes in, you have to be able to break it down to know what you're using this for and so on. You understand? You must be able to know all of that. Now I'm going to deal with that. Okay? Now watch this. Now let me share my screen. Okay? Let me share my screen. This is something I got online from Standard Bank. So Standard Bank, had a, uh, they, have a, they have a nice article here regarding that stuff. So we're just going to go over it. Okay? So I want you to read Okay, I want you to read that. From Standard Bank, what you need to know oh, when drawing up your Standard budget. Bank to zero zero. Standard Bank to zero zero. Okay, read that. From Standard Bank to zero zero. Okay, come on. What you need to know when drawing up your budget. He says, what you need to know when drawing up your budget. Okay, watch this. Now read that, budget tips, read that. Budget tips. Mm -hmm. In the current economy, personal budgeting is more important than ever. Go ahead. If you want financial security, then create a budget and stick to it to ensure you don't spend what you don't, you don't spend what you don't have. So now watch this, it says, then create a budget and stick to it. You see that part right there? When it says create a budget and stick to it, watch this. Give me Sarah 32 real quick. Sarah 32 verse 14. Watch this. I'm going to show you something with what, 
what they just wrote here. It says, then create a budget and stick to it to ensure you don't spend what you're going to have. Read that. It's like 32, 14. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 32, verses 14. Go ahead. Whoso, whoso feareth the Lord will receive his discipline. Mm -hmm. and, and they that seek him early shall find favor. You, you see what it says? It says, whoso feareth the Lord will receive his discipline. So in order for you, budget requires discipline. Really, that's what the Lord is really teaching us. Budget requires discipline. What I'm going to show you later on is that the, these heathens are not smart. You understand? Everything, whether it goes, whether it's how to manage your finances, they all get it from the Bible. They all get it from our book, how to eat, what to eat. Obviously, they're eating garbage. But the point is, they are, they, they, some of them, guess what they do? They eat healthy and so forth. They exercise them. It's all written in the book. You understand? So what I want to show you is that the most High God gave us a book that deals with every aspect of your life. Okay, read that. Budget tips. Budget tips. In the current economy, personal budgeting is more important than ever. Mm -hmm. If you want financial security, then create a budget and stick to it to ensure you don't spend what you don't have. You see that thing? It says, make sure that you create a budget and stick to it. That is what we read in the scripture. Go back again to Zerah 32 verse 14. Read that again. Ecclesiastes chapter 32 verse 14. Read Whoso feareth the Lord will receive his discipline. Mm -hmm. And they that seek him early shall find favor. You see what he's saying? And they that seek him early, we shall find favor. So the Lord is teaching us that we must what? We must receive his discipline. What is his discipline? Get that in Wisdom of Solomon 1 and 5. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 1, verse 5. Okay. We must get into the habit of making of understanding the 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 money that we receive, our salaries that we receive every month. You understand? So we must be, we must get into the habit of knowing how to manage that because that's going to help us a lot individually and as a nation. Okay? Read that. Wisdom of Solomon 1 and 5. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 1 verse 5. Go ahead. For the Holy Spirit of discipline will flee deceit. You see that? The Holy Spirit of discipline. So the Holy Spirit is discipline, is the spirit of discipline. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of discipline. That's why it says, they that fear the Lord will receive his discipline. What is that? The Holy Spirit, because it is the spirit of discipline. So now let's go back to the article. Budgeting is powerful tool. Read that. Budgeting is a powerful tool to manage your money. Mm -hmm. Financial talk show host and writer. Dave Ramsey said it best. A budget is telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. You see that thing? It says a budget is telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. Now that's heavy right there. That's very true, by the way. Okay, we'll go ahead. And while many may associate budgeting with restrictions and limitations, it can be quite the opposite. Budgeting is a budget, budgeting requires discipline. Okay, is that simple? Okay, read that. Creating a budget can help you determine whether you have enough money to do the things you need to do and the things you want to do. So, guess what? Your budget will determine your spending. So, what are you spending money on? Are you spending money on the things you want or are you spending money on the things you need? And you spend more money on the ones than you need. You see that? Go ahead. Good personal budgeting can give you control as well as, as well as financial freedom and flexibility, among many other advantages. Okay, so now let's read that. Two big bonuses of personal budgeting. Let's read that. Two big bonuses of personal budgeting. Mm -hmm. Number one, okay. budgeting puts you in control. Is a budgeting puts you in control? In control of what? In control of what comes in and what goes out. It puts you in control. And in order for you to control what you have received requires the spirit of discipline. You understand? 
You need God's laws to be able to do that. That's what the Lord is saying right there. Read that again. Budgeting puts you in control. Budgeting is going to put you in control. You understand? Because the laws of God will teach you. You understand? Okay, when I receive money, whether I get where, 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 whether I get paid weekly or whether I get paid every two weeks or whether I get paid every month. Once you receive your salary, you understand? The, guess what? Since the spirit of discipline will tell you, okay, before I do anything, let me do my budget because as a nation, we don't do that. Black people don't do stuff like that. Once you get paid, you are ready to turn it up. You want to go to the club. You want to spend your money. That's how we were conditioned from when we were growing up. You understand? Okay, now watch this. Give me Sarah chapter 17. Okay, he's just pick up 17 verse 7. Okay, now read that for me. Ecclesiastes chapter 17, verse 7. Okay. With all, he filled them with the knowledge of understanding and mm -hmm. showed them good and evil. You see what the Lord did? The Lord, he filled us with the knowledge of understanding. What's that? God's laws. He gave us the commandments. The commandments, they are teaching us what? Good and evil. The commandments are going to teach us right from wrong. The commandments of the Lord will teach you what your needs are and what your wants are. Now as a nation, we've forgotten that. You don't know the difference between what you want and what you need. You understand? It's all the same to us. That's why we get paid. Before the month is even done, the money is all gone. Why? Because we don't know how to budget. We don't budget. You understand? Go back to Sarah 42 verse 7 again. Okay? Sarah 42 verse 7. Because budgeting is a law of the most high. We must do that thing. Okay, read what you got. Ecclesiastes chapter 42 verse 7. Go ahead. Deliver all things in number and weight. Mm -hmm. and put all in writing that thou givest out or receivest in. You see that? That's budgeting right there. That's bookkeeping. It's called bookkeeping. It says put all in writing that thou givest out and you, what you receive in. So you receive your salary monthly. Guess what? Once you receive it, you must now keep track. Okay, you do your job. You sit down. You open your spreadsheet. You do a budget. You see, okay, this is how much that came in this month. Okay, when whatever you are spending, whether you are buying fruits and veggies, whatever it is, guess what? You must write it down. What you are spending on and how much you are spending on what on that. The Lord is commanding us as we have to do that as a nation. Okay, now watch this. Now let's go back to the article. Okay. Mm, the thing that I actually want here is there's a few things that I need. I want you to read them. Where you could be overspending. Where you could be overspending. Watch this. Go ahead. The average person overindulges in three main categories, namely. And remember, by and the out. way, hold on. When they say the average person, they are not talking about them. They are talking about us. Because I get in their eyes, we are the average people on this earth. So when it says the average person overindulges in three main categories, they are not talking about themselves. They are talking about us. Go ahead. Namely, dining out. Dining out. Because we love to go out as a people. It's not, not saying that you can't go out with your wife, with your brothers and sisters. You understand? Go to out to dinner and so forth. No, it's written in the script. I'm going to go over that. But we do that. We do, we do this more than we focus on the important stuff. Go ahead. Impulse purchases of fashion or gadgets. You see, that's what we do. Impulse purchases of fashion or gadgets. That's what our people do. We do that thing. Fashion, obviously, the sisters and these effeminate men that wear skinny jeans, that's them. And gadgets. You understand? Go ahead. Entertainment. You see that? That's a big one in Israel. That's a big one in Israel right there. Entertainment. Remember during the lockdown, the, the lockdown restrictions, particularly to alcohol, there was a lot of quarreling regarding that. 
You understand? Because that's where we spend our money on as a nation. You understand? When you come into this truth, these are things that we, you need to sit down and examine. You understand? Make an account of. Okay? Watch this. Now, read that. Budgeting. Number two. Budgeting mm -hmm. helps you keep to your financial goals. You see that? You must have goals. Financial health. Financial health is a law of God. You must have financial health. Just as you need to have spiritual health, your what? Your, your health in terms of your physical health, your diet and so forth. You understand? Your work life, your social life in terms of in this truth, how you deal with brothers and sisters. Guess what? Your health also must be what? On your financials as well. Okay? Ray. Your budget is a living document that will change according to your needs and wants. You see that? It's still going back to that. According to your needs and wants. Remember, your budget dictates your spending. Your spending will dictate if you know the difference between want and need. That's what we read in Surah 17 verse 7. Okay, go ahead. Keeping it accurate and up to date can help you monitor your monthly expenditure. You see achieve that? financial... Your monthly expenditure. Because throughout the month, because we, we are impulsive shoppers, that, you know when you go to the shops, you go to Woolworths, you go... Yeah, Woolworths. You go to Woolworths, right? Pick and pay and all these other shops at the aisle. They be put... They, you, listen, there's chocolates there. There's a whole lot... It's, it's mainly sweet stuff at the aisle where you are going to pay at the tail. You understand? Why is that? Because they know there's a compulsive, there's a compulsive shopper, meaning us, that whereas you are going to pay, you see something because we are covetous. You understand? So because of that, you take, no, I want a bower. I want a Kit Kat. You understand? By the time you get to the tail, you're, 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 you're actually there's unnecessary expenses that you've incurred because of what? Because of the lust of the eyes. Give me that in first John. Okay, give me first John 2 16. Because I actually should have brought it out when we were reading this part. First John 2 verse 16. Read that for me real quick. First John chapter 2, verse 16. Go ahead. For all that is in the world, no, the no, lust no. of the flesh. What verse you at? Verse 16 or 15? 16, sir. Okay, come on, read that again. First John chapter 2, verse 16. Go ahead. For all that is in the world, the lust mm -hmm. of the flesh. You see that? The lust of the flesh. Because the reason why they put those chocolates next to the till, they know we have the lust of the flesh as a people. We are lustful. Because our, as a people, we, are, we have not been applying God's commandments. You understand? Now as we're coming into this truth, we must develop the spirit of discipline. Okay, go ahead. And the last of their eyes. The last of the eyes. Them chocolates. Okay. Those and the pride gums. of life. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Pay attention. They, and he says what? The last of the eyes and the last of the uh, the last of the flesh and the last of the eyes. The last of the eyes is what? Your chocolates, your sweets that you see next to the till, the till point. They just throw them in there. They don't even pack them nice. Especially in the in the in shop rice cokers, they don't care about that. You go to Uluwet, everything is packed nicely. By the time you get to the tail point, listen, you've picked up a couple of things because of what the lust of the eyes. Go ahead. And the pride of life mm -hmm. is not of the father, but is of the world. You see that thing? It's not of the father, but is of the world. Because the Lord said we must not have the spirit of covetousness. Thou shalt not covet. That's the tenth commandment. Okay. Now let's go back to the article now. Okay. Read that again. That uh, the read that. Budgeting helps you to keep your financial goals. Go ahead. Your budget is a living document that will change according to your needs and wants. Mm -hmm. Keeping it accurate and up to date can help you monitor your monthly expenditure. Achieve financial stability. And Come plan on. for any other future financial goals that may arise. Because in order for this to be achieved, we need to plan ahead. You understand? 
That's why the Lord used the end to show us that the end can be, the end knows how to plan ahead. So likewise, we must do the same. Read. A budget can help you stay for a holiday, settle an outstanding debt, put together an emergency fund, or mm. get through the month without a negative balance. You see that? So a budget will help us to do that. You understand? So that we can be, we can be able to plan ahead. The things that we want to do, the things that we need to do, they, they will be dictated by our budget, you understand? And our spending also. Okay, go ahead. Having a budget and knowing where you want to be financially can keep you focused and motivated to stay on track. You see that it requires, what is he saying? It requires discipline. Budgeting requires discipline. You understand? You have to discipline your spirit. Okay, watch this. Keep going. Right? Ultimately, creating a realistic budget and sticking to it enables you to put a solid financial plan in place now and for the future. You see that thing? Now you're gonna start to see, you're gonna start to see some life enter into your, financial, into your finances. Because right now there's a financial death in our finances. Why? Because we are not applying these principles, these laws that the Lord has given unto us. So now these nations are using our book, you understand, to be able to set up the businesses that they've got by using the knowledge that God gave to us. So it's time we return back to this Bible and do what it says. Okay, now watch this. Now, here is is gonna break down the, 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 you know, the budget structure. So as you receive your salary, this is how they, this is the recommended way. So they think, because they make you think that this is their plan. I'm gonna show you in the Bible. Keep going, read that now. Using the 50, 20, 30 rule to divide up your mm -hmm. income. So now some says 50, 30, 20, some says 50, 20, 30. Okay. But I can't understand why they put it like this here. 50, 20, 30. Okay. Come on. Another strategy you may want to work towards is the 50, 20, 30 rule. Really? This approach is simple, can mm -hmm. have a big impact on your budget and is a useful place to start if you are finding it challenging to allocate a total spend to the categories in your budget. Right. In this rule, 50% of your income goes to necessities. Stop right there. So the 50 in the 50, 20, 30 rule, the 50, the 50 is the 50% that goes to your necessities, meaning what? Your needs. So the 50% goes to your needs. Go ahead. 20% to long-term savings really? and 30% to lifestyle choices. You see what he's saying? So 20% is long-term savings, 30% to lifestyle choices. So that 30%, that's where the problem is. You understand? Because we, as a people, we spend time on the 30%. So we end up, the 30% ends up being the 50% because there's no savings that we do. You see that thing? Now watch this. Let's deal with the first one, okay? So read that, allocate what? Allocate 50% to necessities. Mm -hmm. Necessities include your monthly living expenses such as rent or bond payments, uh -huh. water and electricity, food, transport costs, cell phone bills, etc. So now let's stop right there. So now we're going to deal with the 50% of the needs because the most High God gave us what? He gave us the sense to know right from wrong, want from need, okay? Watch this. Give me the book. Give me the book of Sirach 29 verse 21 because Esau didn't come up with this stuff. They get it from the Bible, okay? Read that. Sirach 29, Sirach 29 verse 21. Watch this. Ecclesiastes chapter 29, verse 21. Go ahead. The chief thing for life is water and bread. Mm -hmm. Come on. And clothing and a house to cover shame. Now, this right here, we just, these are the necessities right here. That's the 50% that Isu is talking about. The chief thing for life, these are needs. Water. You need water. You cannot live without water. Bread. That's food. Okay. And clothing. 
You can't be walking around naked and then house to cover shame. That goes into your rent or bond payment. You understand? So the white men didn't come up with this. They read our book. Now watch this. Give me Sarah 39, verse 26. Sarah 39, verse 26. Watch this. Ecclesiastes chapter 39, verse 26. Go ahead. The principal things for the whole use of man's life are water, mm -hmm. fire, iron, Come on. and salt, flour of wheat, honey, milk, and the blood of the grape, and oil, and clothing. Read that verse again, verse 26. Ecclesiastes chapter 39, verse 26. Mm -hmm. The principal things for the whole use of man's life are water. Stop right there. It says the principal things for the whole use of man's life. So the principal things means the important things. This goes into what? The needs. The cheap things for life. Like we read in Sarah 29. Are what? Water. Okay, go ahead. Fire. Fire. Because you need fire to do what? To cook. Okay. Today goes into what? Electricity. That's what it translates into. Go ahead. Iron. And iron, because with iron, what do you do? That's why today you've got houses that are constructed and so forth. You always need that iron man. You need iron. Go ahead. And salt. And salt. Read on. To, you know, to because salt is the same. Read. Flour of wheat. That goes into the bread. Read. Honey. Mm -hmm. Milk. Red. And the blood of the grape. Come on. And oil and clothing. So these are the cheap things for life. These are the important things. These are the needs because this goes into food. It goes into what? It goes into drink. It goes into clothing. You understand? Water. The consumables because we need this. Our bodies need these things to survive. Okay, next verse. Go ahead. All these things are for good to the godly. Mm -hmm. So to the sinners, they are turned into evil. You know why it says that? It says all these things, meaning the above mentioned things, they are good to the godly. Watch this. Give me the book of Exodus, okay? Give me Exodus 20, the 10th commandment. Read that for me. Exodus 20, verse 17. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. Read. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. The reason why is saying all these things are good to the godly is because as a people, we have a covetous spirit. You understand? Because we have a covetous spirit. Because of that, the Lord is saying, listen, all these things are good to the godly because the godly will know how to consume these things in moderation. You're not going to eat them like the world is coming to an end. No. You understand? You're not going to consume them like that. So, but to the sinner, it says they are turned into evil. We always have lack. We always have lack because two things. You see, money, okay, and women, these are the two main areas where our people we have problems with. Everything else is just in the between, but those are the two main ones that, you know, the world of Israel revolves around. We, as, if, as if we're not keeping God's commandment. And when you come in Israel, these are the two main things that you're gonna be dead, you're gonna be flip-flopping between the two. You understand? These are the trials that are going to come upon you. And the Lord will make sure that we put the spirit on to bring these classes out to get our minds right. You see that thing? Now, watch this. Now, we dealt with that, right? Now, I'm going to show you something about this 20%. Now, go back to the article. Read the 20%. Allocate 20% to long-term savings. Mm-hmm. Long-term savings include the money you set aside for emergency yeah. fund savings. That's what we don't do. As a people, we don't do stuff like that. Go ahead. Education investment funds. Stop right there. Now, you see, I'm going to show you something. You see the savings? Our people do that, but they only do it for December. 
because in January they start. They save up money. They're not doing it for anything important. No, they save it so that in December, they split the money, they drink all of it. That's the mindset of the Negro. We need to change that mindset. You understand? That's what the Lord is trying to show us here. Okay, read that again. Emergency fund. Emergency fund savings. Mm -hmm. Education investment funds. Read. Long-term investments. Long-term investments, go ahead. Savings towards your retirement, etc. We don't think about that because whenever we get money, we just spend it on useless things. So we always want, we always have money problems every month. There's always a problem. Why? Because we are not applying the laws of God when it comes to what financial health. But today is a day where the most I put the spirit on to get this thing done, to do it correctly. You understand? Now watch this. Give me it. Give me Genesis forty-seven, verse twenty-four. Genesis chapter forty-seven. This is our forefather Joseph, okay, in Egypt. Watch what he did here, okay. You know what? Hmm. Started. Give me Genesis forty-one first. Get Genesis forty-one, verse thirty-three. Genesis forty-one, verse thirty-three. I'm gonna show you. You see, the white man didn't come up with this, okay. Esau didn't come up. He's not. He's not that smart. Now read that. Genesis forty-one, verse thirty-three. Now, this is after our forefather Joseph inter interpreted the dream for Pharaoh, okay? He interpreted the dream for Pharaoh. Now he's, he's providing the solution of what they need to do. Watch this. Read that. Genesis 41, 33. Genesis chapter 41, verse 33. Go ahead. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise mm -hmm. and set him over the land of Egypt. Go ahead. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. So now, because remember, the, the first seven years is, the, is, the, is those years of plenty. So Joseph is saying, in the first seven years of plenty, you must take out 20%. That's what the fifth part is. The fifth part is the 20%. That's where the white man gets it from. You understand? He didn't just come up with this. It says, take up the fifth part of the land in the land of the land of what of the land of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. Go ahead. And let them gather all the food of those good years that come mm -hmm. and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. You see that thing? These are savings now. They are, they are saving because. There's going to be seven years of famine that is going to come after the first seven years of plenty. Right? And that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, mm -hmm. which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. Okay, come on. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. Right? And Pharaoh said unto his servants, can we find such an one as this is, a man in whom the spirit of God is? You see that? The spirit of the Lord has to be in you for you to be able to know how to do this. The spirit of the Lord is God's laws. When we apply God's commandments, the most High God will give us sense. And when we make decisions, they are going to be sensible decisions. Unlike what we are doing now as a nation. We need to fix that with God's commandments. Okay. Now, give me the book of Proverbs. You know what? Give me Genesis 47 now. Verse 27, verse 24. Genesis chapter 47, verse 24. Read that. Genesis chapter 47, verse 24. Go ahead. And it shall come to pass in the increase that ye shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh. The fifth, and part, part, the fifth part, that's the 20%. Go ahead. And four parts shall be your own mm -hmm. for the seed of the field and for your food and for them of your household and for food for your little ones. So now it says the rest of the, or the rest of the, 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 save, the, the money that you've got will be for yourself, for the seed of the field, because we needed to plant and so forth. Okay. And it's for your food and for your what? For them of your households and for the food for your little ones. So this goes into the needs as well. So now 
Joseph is breaking down, he says the 20%, that's gonna be for your savings and so forth through Pharaoh. And the rest is gonna be for what? That's the needs. You need to deal with the needs. He didn't mention the entertainment part, which is is allocated 30% of that. You understand? So, but this principle of the 30, the 50, 30, 20 rule, they get it from the Holy Bible. Give me Proverbs 13, verse 22. Because our forefathers, they knew how to budget. They knew how to save up. They knew how to do this. That's why they were able to do what They could marry their kids. You understand? They took care of their families. They had that spirit. We lost that spirit. Now we're getting the flavor back. Watch this. Give me Proverbs 13, verse 22. Read that. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22. Go ahead. A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. You see that? A good man. A good man. Okay. It says a good man will leave an inheritance to his children's children. So what makes this man to be good? Watch this. Give me that in um, 1 Timothy 1 verse 8. This is what, ma what makes this man to be good. It says a good man will leave an inheritance to his children's children. Okay. Read that. 1 Timothy 1 and 8. Go ahead. First Timothy chapter one, verse eight. Mm -hmm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. You see what it's saying? We know that the law is good. If a man use the laws of God lawfully, meaning don't abuse God, don't manipulate scriptures. That's what he's saying. If you use it lawfully. So if you apply God's commandments, the laws of God is good. But guess what? Go back to Proverbs now, 18 verse 22 again. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22. Mm -hmm. A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. So a good man is talking about a man that knows God's laws, a man that applies God's commandments. If you say you are good, it means you're keeping the commandments of the Mosai. Read. And the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. So now what I want to show you something here. It says the wealth and the wealth of the sinner is going to be laid up for the just. Because guess what? This good man, this man that keeps God's commandments, they're going to know how to what? How to budget even for the what? For the grandkids they're going to have. They are not just thinking about their immediate children that they have or they are going to have. No, they are already planning for their grandkids. That's another level of understanding right there. That's another level of application. We need to apply ourselves, brothers and sisters. You understand? The most High God has given us the greatest knowledge on earth. You understand? And the churches are playing with this book. Not in Israel. We're going to enforce this law. You understand? Why? Because that's part of the reason why we're having problems in Israel. We don't know how to manage money. We don't know how to do that. We, once you get money, already your fingers are itching. You just want to go out and buy something. You understand? We don't have the spirit of discipline. Now watch this. Give me, give me the book of Job. I'm going to give an example of our forefather Job. Okay. Our forefather Job, he was a wealthy man. But guess what? This is the, this is the, this is the mindset and spirit he moved in. Because I mean, if you look at today, when you look at today, you see our, our people in the world that have money, they are rich, they are wealthy, and so forth. Listen, once the father dies. Let's say the father's businesses and so forth. We see it all the time. It's a cliche. Once the father dies, what happens to the business? What happens to the kid? Because even the fathers don't teach their children the business that they are in. A lot of them, their children are spoiled. They are dumb as hell. They don't know what to do with what? With the, with the, with the business that their father is running. And the fathers also, they don't invest time to teach their sons and daughters the business that they are in. They don't do that. So when he, once he's gone, that business crumbles. You understand? Because he was only thinking about the here and the now. He wasn't thinking that the next two generations or three generations that come after him. You understand? So we need to change that mindset. Okay? Give me Job 41. Job chapter 41 verse 12. Watch this. Job chapter 41 verse 12. Go ahead. I will not conceal his parts, mm -hmm. nor his what? power. 42, 42, 42, 42, verse 12. Job chapter 42, verse 12. Read. Right. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. 
Mm. For he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and a thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand she asses. Right? So he was wealthy. He was wealthy. Go ahead. He had also seven sons and three daughters. Right? And he called the name of the first Jemima. Mm. And the name of the second, Kazia. And the name Keziah. of the third, Keziah. Keziah is the second born boy. And the name of the second, Keziah. Ray. And the name of the third, Karen Hapu. So now these are the daughters now. Now watch what, because remember, he had seven children now in total. Ray. And in all the land where no women found so fair as the daughters of Job. Mm -hmm. And their father, gave them inheritance among their brethren. You see what he did? He says, and their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. So the, the brothers, they also receive inheritance and the daughters as well. They also receive inheritance. Watch this, go ahead. After this lived Job 140 years and saw his sons and his mm. son's sons, even mm. four generations. You see what he did? So. Listen, four generations is so, and those four generations, guess what? They survived of the what? Of the inheritance that he gave to his sons and daughters. You understand that? Because go back to Proverbs 18, verse 22. So we understand this thing, okay? Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22. Right? A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. Mm -hmm. And the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. I want you to pay attention to that. It says, a good man liveth an inheritance to his children's children. That's the mindset of our forefather Job. Our forefather Job, that's how he thought. He thought like that. Why? Because he was following after the footsteps of his forefathers. I'm going to prove that. Give me Genesis 24. Genesis 24, verse 34. This is when Abraham sent his servants to look for a wife for our grandfather Isaac. Okay, read that. You know what? Before you get there, let me just preface our preface it with this. Give me um, Genesis 13, verse 1. Genesis chapter 13, verse 1. Watch this. Genesis chapter 13, verse 1. Mm -hmm. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and Wait. all that he had, and Wait. Lord with him, into the south. Wait. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, mm. and in gold. You see that? It says, Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. So our forefather Abraham was rich. Well, he was a wealthy man. Watch this. Now get Genesis 24, verse 34 now. Watch this. Genesis chapter 24, verse 34. Go ahead. And he said, I am Abram's servant. Mm -hmm. Come on. And the Lord had blessed my master greatly, and he has become great. Mm -hmm. And he had given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and manservants mm -hmm. and maidservants and camels and asses. You see what he's saying? He says, he now is describing how wealthy our forefather Abraham our forefather Abraham is. So what is he saying? What is he explaining here? He is letting the, the, the in-laws, the potential in-laws know that, listen, their husband, your, your daughter is not going to marry into a poor family. That's what he's telling them. Go ahead. Watch this. Right? And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old. Mm -hmm. And unto him has he given all that he has. You see that? And unto him have he given, is, is he given, have he given all that he has. So everything that our forefather had, Abraham had, guess what? He gave all those, he gave these wealth to our grandfather Isaac. Watch this. Get Genesis 25 now. Genesis chapter 25, read verse 5. Watch this. Genesis chapter 25, verse 5. Mm -hmm. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. You see that? Abraham. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. 
So our forefathers, they always had, they always understood that. You understand? Or whatever, what you have now is not, just, is not just about you. No, it's about those that come after you and those that are, listen, generations. We must think like that. Even in captivity, that's the mindset we must have. Because when we are in the kingdom, how are we going to be able to know how to do that if we never rehearsed it in captivity? I mean, come on. Let's think now. Especially you, I need you men to think. Watch this. Get Judges 5 and 11. Because some of us, we in La La Land, we don't understand what this is about. We need to understand what the Lord is teaching us here. Judges chapter 5. Let's read that. Judges 5 and 11. I'm going to show you something with this. Because 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 I know the mind of the Negro. The Negro might be thinking, yeah, but our forefather, our forefathers was rich. We are not like that today. Mm -hmm. Okay, watch this. Get that in Judges 5 verse 11. Judges chapter 5 verse 11. Read. They that are delivered from the noise of arches in the places mm -hmm. of drawing water. Meaning in captivity. They that are delivered from the noise of arches. An archer doesn't make noise. So this is letting you know, is talking about the type of archer that makes noise. In these last days, that's talk about an ICBM missile. We will be delivered from the what? Nuclear war, nuclear apocalypse that's coming on this earth, right? They that are delivered from the noise of arches in the places of drawing water, mm -hmm. there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord. Stop right there. It says there, in the lands of our captivity, in the places of drawing water, it says we will what? We will rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord. What are the part of, as part of those righteous acts is what? Knowing how to manage your money, how to budget. You understand? Watch this, because in the New Testament, they mentioned it as well again. Give me that in Titus 2. Titus 2, verse 11. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Read. Really? For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, mm -hmm. teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. In this present world, meaning what? The grace of God teaches us to do what? To rehearse the righteous acts. So that's what the Apostle Paul is explaining here. We must rehearse the righteous acts in this present world. Part of those righteous acts is knowing how to manage your budget. Watch this. Okay. Give me Luke 16 verse 10. Because we might be thinking, because we're in captivity, we don't have to do that. Our forefathers was not in captivity. So guess what? We cannot do what they did because we are not wealthy. They were. No. Watch this. Give me that in Luke 16, verse 10. This is what Christ said about this thing. Read it. Luke chapter 16, verse 10. Come on. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. You see what Christ said? It says, if you are faithful in that which is small, you are also going to be faithful in that which is more. What is he talking about? Because right now we are in captivity. We are impoverished. So Christ says we must be faithful with what? With, with the little that we have. Because this is the mercy of the Lord. That we are able to even have jobs in the lands of our slavery. By right, we're not supposed to have these things. We're not supposed to have roof over our heads. But because of the mercy of the Lord, yes, he's punishing us. But he's also allowing us to have jobs so we can what? Take care of, take care of our, ourselves and our families and our nation. So we can repent and be able to build houses and so forth and take care of our families and teach them the laws of God. So that's all the mercy of the Lord. Read that again, verse 10. Go ahead. Luke chapter 16, verse 10. Mm -hmm. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Go ahead. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. This is not an opinion. This is a fact. So if you are faithful in, in this, the least, he says you are also faithful in much, meaning in the kingdom. Because in the kingdom, we're going to get things. We, you know what? There's not going to be limit to the things we're going to receive. So if you are faithful now with the least, 
you are definitely faithful in that which is much when we receive the kingdom. Go ahead. And, but if you are unjust in the least, you are also unjust in that which is much. You see that? Read. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, mm. who will commit to your trust the true riches? The true riches is as if you have not been unfaithful with what? The salaries that we get every month. Because that's the little. That's little. You understand? Just so we can survive. So Christ says, if you are not faithful in that, there is no way you will be faithful in the kingdom too. So now he's saying, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Christ says, he will not commit to our trust the true riches in the kingdom because we have not learned to be faithful in the least. You get the least, you put a budget together. You know how to manage what comes in. You know what to write down what goes out. Watch where you spend your money on. You see that? So the Lord is saying, we need to think about those things. Okay? Because a lot of us, we don't think about that stuff. Now, watch this. Let's go to, let's go back to the article. Okay? I want to go back to the article. Now, read that part right there when it says, allocate 30%. Read that. Allocate 30% to lifestyle spending. Mm, right? This 30% allocation applies to anything that isn't a basic necessity. You see that? You see how, is even how Iso is written this? It says, this, um, this 30% allocation applies to anything that isn't a basic necessity. So what is he saying? They're saying that the 30% of lifestyle spending it's a necessity, but it's not as much of a necessity. So is it a necessity? No, this is a want. This 30%, that's a want. You understand? It's not a necessity. It's a want. But this is making you, you see how this is the devil. Even the way he writes things, he says, it's not isn't anything that isn't a, a basic necessity. So what is he saying? He's telling you this 30% is also a necessity. No, it's not. That's a want right there. You understand? So open your spiritual eyes. Read that part again. The 30, this 30% 30 allocation applies to anything that isn't a basic necessity. Mm -hmm. The 30% allows you to save monthly and binge on the things you enjoy, such as Go ahead. entertainment, restaurants, upscale mm -hmm. clothing, gadgets, furniture and home deco, kids, toys and activities, etc. You see that part right there? Kids, toys and activities. You see that part when it says upscale clothing? You see, this part right there, that's where you see really, obviously entertainment is number one in Israel, in our people, okay, restaurants. Upscale clothing, that goes into what? That goes into Gucci, those Gucci bags, Gucci handbags, Gucci man bags. All of these things, all these skinny type of clothes that you see our brothers be wearing this day. You understand? This goes into these labels, Rolf Lauren. All these, the names of Edomites. Yeah. Could you imagine that? Think about it. I'm going to put it like this. Yeah, a, a, a white man puts you in slavery, right? And he, because they branded us. They branded us like cattle. That's why it's called chattel slavery. Because literally, they treated us like cattle. You understand? So they would brand their names on our back with a hot iron. That's what they did in slavery. You understand? So now, generations later, they create uh, clothing labels with the names they used to brand on our backs. Now, the black man, once he gets money, he runs to Santin. They be buying Louis Vuitton. Who's Louis Vuitton? Do you even know him? You don't even know who Louis Vuitton is, but the black man will spend everything he's got to get a Louis Vuitton bag, a Louis Vuitton watch, a Gucci watch, a Gucci bag. Watch this. I'm going to show you something real quick. Get the book of Psalms 49 verse 11. I'm going to show you something here. Because we read this scripture all the time regarding when the white man conquers a place, he names that place that he conquered after his own name, right? It's, it's not only just limited to the lands he conquered. Watch this. 
get that in uh, Psalms 49 verse 11. Psalms chapter 49 verse 11. Mm -hmm. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever. Go ahead. And they are dwelling places to all generations. Mm. They call their lands after their own names. They call their lands after their own name. Remember, the land, who do they find in the land? The inhabitants of the land. Then the inhabitants of the land, guess what? They are going to be what? They are the labor, they are the workforce. Okay. And guess what? You are the labor force and they change your name because that's what they did. Not only that, they started to create, they, create, they created what? These clothing uh, shops, everything that we need because the basic needs, we're gonna go to them for them. You understand? Now, our people, our people, they are spending money to have a, to wear a white man's name. That's how low we have fallen as a people. I'm, not, I'm just painting a picture for you. So you can really see what's going on, how destroyed we are. That was just a, just a small sidebar, okay? Now watch this. Because we're dealing with the 30% the of lifestyle spending, I'm gonna show you something with this, right? So this is where the gray area takes place because at this point, we there's a lot of gray areas here with the 30% lifestyle spending. And oh boy, do we love to spend. You understand? Now, I'm gonna show you something with this right here. Watch this. Give me the book of Ecclesiastes 2 verse 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 10. Go ahead. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. That's our people right there. Because this King Solomon speaking is regretting. Because the book of Ecclesiastes is a book of regret. So he's telling us what not to do. Meaning don't overindulge. That's the entertainment lifestyle spending 30%. That's what this is going into. Go ahead. I withheld not my heart from any joy. Come on. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor. Mm. And this was my portion of all my labor. You see what he's saying? It says whatever he desired, whatever he saw with his eyes, he bought it. He got it for himself. The last of the eyes. So that's what that was the problem. He started to what to have a covetous and a lustful spirit. So likewise, when our people now the thirty percent, that's where the majority of Israel spends their money on the thirty percent. So it's not thirty percent on the budget, no, because there's no budget. Whenever the black man or black woman gets paid. 50% goes to this part right here, not 30%, 50. Because the 0% that is allocated to savings, because black people don't save, we don't save money. We believe in spending. That's why we are consumers. We are, we are the consumers of the earth. We don't produce anything, we just consume. You see that? So the 30% is really just, you know, they, 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 it's, not, it's not accurate based on how we move. Okay, get to like 14 verse 3. I'm going to show you that that 30% is not accurate. Watch this. Okay, it's accurate when it comes to the other nations, but to the nation of Israel, the blacks and the Hispanics, Native American Indians, Bantus, it doesn't apply. And I'm going to prove that. Get to like 14 verse 3. I'm going to show you that it's not accurate. Watch this. Ecclesiastes chapter 14 verse 3. Go ahead. Riches are not comely for a niggard. You see what the Bible is saying? It says riches are not comely. Meaning what? Riches is not something that is honorable in the mind of the nigger. It says for a niggard, a niggard person. You know what a niggard is? It goes into what? Somebody that is what? Unam Hopol is covetous. So riches are not comely. Okay, read. And what should an envious man do with money? You see that? So there is no, when we have money, we spend it in an envious way. What I mean by that is we want to live like the other nations. We want to live like white folks. We want to live like Chinese, Indians, or Arabs, and so forth. We want to live like them. That's why it says, what should an envious man do with money? What do, what do our people do today? 
You see, Kaspanyoves just bought the latest McLaren. You see, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to show you where the mindset of our people is at. You know how many houses you can buy with that money that you spend on the car? Mm. McLaren, because that's not a $100,000, uh, it's not a $100,000 car. That's millions on that car. You understand? I'm showing you that's where our mind is at. You understand? And they are breaking or no, I think is 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 they say it's two of them that have that car in South Africa. So that's some that, that's that's where the mindset of our people is. You understand? Read that again, verse three, because this verse applies more specifically to our people in the world and our people in Israel. Spending money we don't have. Read what you got. Ecclesiastes chapter 14, verse 3. Mm -hmm. Riches are not comely for your naked. Go ahead. And what should an envious man do with money? They will buy a matlare. That's what they will do. That's what an envious man do with his money. An envious woman, that, guess what they will do? They will bleach their skin and put on a blonde wig to look like Becky, to look like um, Karen. That's what they will do. Look what Bukanyimba was doing. You understand? That's what they do because what? The spirit of envy. Now watch this. Jump down to verse 8. Read. Ecclesiastes chapter 14 verse 8. Come on. The envious man has a wicked eye. You see that? The envious man has a wicked eye. Meaning what? They look at something. They look at it with the spirit of envy and covetousness. I also want that. They will do anything and everything to get it. Because now you see Bukaspa University, they are dating women that come from rich families. So now he has become a gold digger. What happened to being the man? Hmm? What happened to them? That's the mindset of our people. The reason why I'm bringing them up is because our people are looking up to them. That's why I'm bringing this up. Read that again, verse 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 14, verse 8. Mm -hmm. The envious man has a wicked eye. He turneth away his face and despiseth men. You see, you see what he's saying? He turns away his face and despiseth men. Meaning he's willing to do anything and everything, even if it means destroying his own nation, destroying his own brothers, just so that he can get what he wants, because he's envious. He's got a wicked eye. Okay, go ahead. A covetous man's eye is not satisfied with his portion. That's the key right there. A man or woman that's covetous, they are not satisfied with their portion. They are not content. Watch this. Give me that in Sirach chapter 40. Give me Sirach 40 verse 18. They are not content. They are not satisfied. You understand? Watch this. Read that. Ecclesiastes chapter 40 verse 18. Read. To labor and to be content with that a man has is a sweet to be, life. To be what? Hold on. To be what? To be content. Mm -hmm. You see that? With that, that a man has. has. The word content, that's foreign to our people. They don't understand that. It says to be content with that a man has. Read on. Is a what? He is a sweet life. You see that? So because a covetous man, an envious man, they will not be content with what they have. Because the Lord is letting you know they don't have a sweet life. They have a miserable life. That's what the Lord is telling you. Go ahead. But he that findeth the treasure is above them both. The treasure is the Bible, the Holy Scriptures. Because ask applying what is written, we will get the true riches when the Lord returns. So go back. Sirach chapter 14, verse 9. Come on. Ecclesiastes chapter 14, verse 9. Mm-hmm. A covetous man's eye is not satisfied with his portion. Really? And the iniquity of the wicked drives up his soul. You see that? Because you're not satisfied with your portion, it says the iniquity of the wicked. Because what is, this? What is the iniquity? Covetousness. He says it's going to dry up your soul. That's why the Lord is letting you know they don't have a sweet life because they are always miserable all the time. Next verse. Go ahead. A wicked eye envieth his bread, mm. and he is a niggard at his table. Now that's heavy right there. Now that's read that again, verse 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 14, verse 10. Mm -hmm. 
a wicked eye envieth his bread, mm. and he is a niggard at his table. So if you have if you are a, you have a wicked eye, remember what we read in verse eight and nine. A wicked eye, he says, they will envy their own bread. What does that mean? Here you are, you've got, you've got money, you've got food. You understand? Now let's say I'm going to a simple kind of example. You are given food to eat. The way you eat is as though somebody else is going to eat your food while you are eating it. You eat in a hurry. Like, listen, the, the food is boom on your, on your lap. Within five minutes, the food is done. Even the, the way you, you eat, you can see, it's like, what's wrong with this brother? You give him food. <laughs> Within five minutes, the, the whole plate is finished. Because why? If the Lord says, read that again, verse 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 14, verse 10. Mm -hmm. A wicked eye envieth his bread. Come on. And he is a niggard at his table. He's a niggard. So likewise, you get your money at the end of the month, you, are, you envy your own money. You envy your own salary that you get. Because once you get it, you just want to, listen, you just want to finish the whole thing quickly. He says he's a nigger in his table. Now give me chapter 31, verse 24. Chapter 31, verse 24. Let's deal with that nigger mindset. Okay, read that. Ecclesiastes chapter 31, verse 24. Mm -hmm. But against him that is a niggard of his meat, the whole city shall murmur. You see that? If you are a niggard of your meat, meaning you envy your own bread, it says the whole city is going to murmur, meaning everybody going to complain. Go ahead. And the testimonies of his niggardness shall not be doubted of. You see that? The testimonies because many people are going to talk about it, is that the testimonies of his niggardness shall not be doubted of. Nobody's going to doubt. That's a niggard right there. He is a niggard. Okay, now watch this. But there are some solutions on to deal with this stuff. The reason why this has to be brought out is because why? This is medicine for us. Because this, this, pro this, this problem affects all of us in Israel, even without, even outside our people, don't know their Israel, our people are experiencing this thing. So in Israel, we have the solutions. We must apply it to our lives and get our minds right. Watch this. Now, does it mean that you cannot, you cannot um, entertain and so forth? Okay, let's go back to the article so we can, we can refresh our minds. Because I know we forget quickly. Let's go back there. Okay, read that. Allocate 30%. Read that part again. Allocate 30% to lifestyle spending. Okay, now read the point. Entertainment, restaurants, mm -hmm. upscale clothing, gadgets, furniture and home decor, kids' toys and activities, etc. Now, all of this goes into entertainment. Okay, they just fall under it. Watch this. Now, let me deal with the brothers. Okay, I'm going to deal with men and women alike. Watch this. Give me 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 33. This is true. If you have a wife, you have a husband, you understand? This is what you must do. It doesn't, the Lord is not saying you cannot enjoy um, yourself with your wife. You cannot enjoy yourself with your husband, your Lord. He's not saying that. You cannot go out with your brothers and sisters. You go to the movies. The Lord is not saying you cannot do that. But you must do that based on a budget that you put together. That's what he's saying. Okay, First Corinthians chapter 7, read verse 33. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 33. Mm -hmm. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. You see that? If you are married, he says, you care for the things of the world, how you may please your wife. So that meaning what? You must enjoy your life with your wife. You see that? The Lord is saying that. He's not saying you can't go out with your wife. So don't get it twisted. In the truth, you can do that and approve those things. Get Ecclesiastes 9 and 9. Let's read that. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 9. Because some people might be thinking, oh, that means in the truth, I cannot go out with my wife. We always went to war. You understand? We'd be blasting, putting our scriptures to our people out there. No, it's not always like that. 
The same for everything. Ecclesiastes 9 and 9. Watch this. Read that for me. Come on. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 9. Mm -hmm. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity. You see that? Which he has he given thee joy, under the sun. On. Wait, live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity. Because we don't live forever now because the Lord has not made his second coming yet. So guess what? It says the life that we do have before the Lord calls us back home. It says, listen, live it joyfully with your wife. Okay, go ahead. Which he has given thee under the sun all mm -hmm. the days of thy vanity. Right. For that is thy portion in this life and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. You see what he's saying? So enjoy, enjoy your marriage with your wife. Sisters, enjoy your marriages with your Lord. That's what the Lord is saying. Because guess what? Yes, we go to war. Yes, we attend class. But there must be time where you spend with your wife. The hell is this? Give me the book of Genesis 26 verse 7. I'm going to give an example of our forefathers. Okay. Our forefathers, yeah, they were, they were men of war. But guess what? They also, they were romantic men. If I can say that, if that's even the word. Because you never find the word romantic in the Bible. But watch this. I'm going to give an example with this. Genesis 26, verse 7. Read that for me. Genesis chapter 26, verse 7. Now, this is our grandfather, our grandfather Isaac. Okay? They went to Gerar because there was a famine in the land where they was. So now they had, the Lord paid our forefather Isaac a visit for him to move to go to a place where there is not good they are not going to experience famine and so forth now read that go ahead genesis chapter 26 verse 7 mm -hmm. and the man of the place asked him of his wife and he said she is my sister for he feared to say she is my wife lest mm. said he the man of the place should kill me for rebecca because she was fair to look upon you notice already, this is a common thing with our forefathers and their wives. So because Israel has the best looking women on earth. Understand that. Israel has the best looking women on earth. The black women, the best looking women on earth. They, we just we need to clean them up with the laws of God while we're getting our minds right. You understand as the men? The nations know this, by the way. Okay, I'm going to give an example. Okay, sidebar. Give me the book of Judith real quick. Okay, I'm gonna tangent, small tangent. Watch this thing right here. Because this is what they said about our forefathers, our, I mean, our foremothers. Give me Judith 10, read verse 18. Watch this. Hmm. Judith, chapter 10, verse 18. Go ahead. The apocrypha. Come on. Then was there. Judith, chapter Let's 10, verse 18. Then was there a concourse throughout all the camp, for her coming was noised among the tents, and they mm. came about her, as she stood without the tent of Holofenes, till they told him of her. Right. Now let's talk about our former Judith. Right. And they wondered at her beauty. They wondered. You know what it means to wonder? You be sitting like you said, oh my God. That's the mindset. That's how the heathen look at our women. Okay, right now they disrespect us because the image of the black man, the image of the black woman is that of twerking and shaking their bums on TikTok. Listen, we're going to use the laws of God to clean that up. Understand that the image of the black man is the one wearing smoking weed. You understand? Wearing pink shoes and a blonde hair. Them days are over. We will use the laws of God to clean that up. Okay, come on. And they wondered at her beauty and admired the children of Israel because of her. Mm. And everyone said to his neighbor, who would despise these people that have among them such women? Mm. Surely it is not good that one man of them be left. Who be let saying? go? Hold on. It says, you see what they're saying? It says, who would despise these people that have among them such women? Who can hate these people with such beautiful women? Now, what's this? Surely, it is not good that one of them be left. Who is he talking about? Talk about the men, us, the black men. 
So what, how did the white man solve this problem? He separated the black woman from the black man and said, black woman, you are independent. You are push the feminist movement and separate from your black man. That's how the, black, the white man solved the problem. He didn't wonder at it and sit there and do nothing. No, he did something about it. You understand? That's why they are pushing independent black women. You will never hear any other nation there are women say stuff like that. It's only the black women who say that. Okay, Ray? Surely it is not good that one man of them be left, who being let go might deceive the whole earth. You see what he's saying? He says their beauty will deceive the whole earth. That's why the other nations, they are trying to look like our women. You understand? So, but that's the topic for another day. Let's go back to Genesis 26. Verse 7 again. Okay, come on. Genesis chapter 26, verse 7. Read. And the man of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, mm -hmm. she is my come sister. Mm. For he feared to say, she is my wife. Lest said he, the man of the place should kill me for Rebecca, because she was fair to look upon. Go ahead. So he said, instead, you my sister, just like our forefather Abraham did. Read. And it came to pass, when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the, Phil of the Philistines, looked out at the window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. You see that? It says, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. What were they doing? I mean, you can imagine the scene. They were holding hands. You understand? Tiptoeing through the two lips. You know, they were enjoying each other's company. So when Abimelech saw this, like, no, 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 no. That's not your sister. You don't move like that with your sister, holding hands, kissing and all that stuff. I mean, you can just really imagine it, what was going on. That's why he was able to quickly pick up what, that's not brother and sister, that's husband and wife right there. So I'm bringing this out because it doesn't mean you cannot go out on a date with your wife, go out to dinner to a restaurant. You can do that. You understand? Because our forefathers did it. Okay, read. And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety, she is thy wife. You see what he said? He said, No, 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 for sure, I'm sure she's your wife. Because he saw them. Or, uh, no, that's not brother and sister. Go ahead. And how sayest thou, she's my sister? Mm -hmm. And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, lest I die for her. You see that thing? So now, watch this. Now, I'm going to deal with um, the women as well, because it's not just saying the men must, must, must please their wife, must not focus on that. No. Watch this. Go back to 1 Corinthians 7. Let me, let me clear that up, because I know sisters will be using this. Yeah, but you must, must. Mm -mm. We need to understand the laws of God came going to war. Your nation comes first. I need you men to get your mind right. You understand? Pay close attention. Now give me 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is not saying that, um, you know what, let's just read it because it's written in there. I'm going to show you something with this. 1 Corinthians, read chapter 7 and verse... Read verse 29. 1 Corinthians 7, 29. The Lord is going to give you, is going to give us the, what, the order on where our priorities must be. Okay, read. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29. Mm -hmm. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. Now you see that? It says those that have wives, they must be as though they had none. So is he saying like you must just drop your wife like a bad habit? No, 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 it's not saying that. Because verse 33 is letting you know that, guess what? You, you must go out with your wife. You understand? It must not be just camp. You understand? Going to war, flyer missions, okay? Classes and so forth. No, no, no. You must make time for your wife. You understand? Because it's also health. You must, you must balance it out. That's why we're going over these seven pillars of repentance. Okay? That's why we're doing that. Okay, watch this. Mm, jump down to verse 34 now. Read that. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 34. 
Mm -hmm. There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. Mm. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord. Stop right there. So is a, there's a difference between a wife and a virgin. A wife is a married woman, obviously. A virgin is a young woman of marriageable age. And a virgin goes in two ways. A virgin goes into a sister that has not dealt with a man ever in her life. It also a, means a young woman of marriageable age. Let's, let's read that actually. Get that in Genesis. Um, Genesis with our, for, our foremother, Rebecca. Get Genesis 24, verse 16. Start of verse 15. We're going to read 15 and 16. Genesis chapter 24, verse 15. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass before he had done speaking that behold, Rebekah came out who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. Okay, come on. And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, what? Neither a virgin. You see, it says a virgin, then comma. There's a comma there. A virgin, meaning a young woman of marriageable age. Secondly, go ahead. Neither had any man known her. You see that? She was a young woman of marriageable age. Not only that, this particular sister, which is our former mother, Rebecca, had, she had not dealt with a man. Okay, go ahead. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. I just wanted to explain that. Okay, let's go back. First Corinthians 7.34 again. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 34. Read. Right. There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cared for the things of the Lord, That's that the she may be holy. The, the virgin is that unmarried woman that must care for the things of the Lord. Go ahead. That she may be holy both in body and in spirit. Mm -hmm. But she that is married cared for the things of the world how she may please her husband. You see that? How she may please her husband. Okay, I just wanted to bring that out because I know sisters like to use semantics. Okay, so that was a loophole that I needed to plug real quick. Okay, now watch this. Let's deal with the men now, the brothers, single men and women. Give me that in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 32 now. Go back there. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 32. Let's read that. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32. Mm-hmm. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. You see that? He says, I would have you without carefulness, meaning without worry. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. So that goes for both men and women, because we read it in verse 34 for the sisters. The man, it goes into the same thing. Now, what do they do to, to please the Lord? Watch this. Give me 1 Corinthians 16, 15. Meaning what? You must keep busy. You must stay in the spirit. You must always abound in the work of the Lord so you don't get distracted. Okay? You start choking the chicken, watching porn, which will be put out. Okay? Get that. 1 Corinthians 16, 15. Read that. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15. Go ahead. I beseech you, brethren, Ye you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. What did they do? They have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. That's what that's what that's the mindset. Single men and women, the Lord says, addict yourself to the ministry of the saints. You must be addicted to what? To doing the work of the Lord. That's where your focus is. Building your spirit up. You understand? Helping your nation. Getting your mind right. If it's the health that is an issue that you're dealing with, you focus on that. Get your mind right. You understand? Be right with the law. If it's finances, make sure that you are financially healthy. You understand? So on and so forth. If it's your social skills, you don't have social skills when you're among the brethren. You don't know how to conduct yourself. Guess what? Seek counsel. We will show you in the scriptures the things that you need to do in order to get rid of that black cash demon. You understand? The scriptures is there, which is the solutions. Okay. Give me Toby 12 verse 8. 
because we don't forget the thought. We're still dealing with that 30%. We established that is not the 30%, it's more than that, based on how we as our people do, how our people move without these laws. Watch this, 12, 12 is eight. So the, 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 the arm, the, the funds that you get because you've done your budget, you know, you dealt with your needs, you dealt with the savings. Now is the lifestyle spending which goes into your entertainment and so forth, restaurant, going out with your brothers and sisters. But guess what? You, you need to divide that up because part of that 30% must go to what? Must go to the arms in the body because we're not gonna be able to reach the places we go to on our good looks. No, we need arms. So don't get it twisted. Get that in um, Toby, 12 verse 8, Toby. Because our forefather Toby, he explained this thing to his son Tobias. Watch this. Toby, chapter 12, verse 8. Go ahead. Prayer is good with fasting and arms and righteousness. Mm -hmm. A little with righteousness is better than much with unrighteousness. It is better to give arms than to lay up gold. You see what the Bible is saying? It says, it is better to give arms than to lay up gold. Why? Because imagine you saving up money because they, they, there's savings, which is long-term and so forth, but you're saving up money, but you don't even know what you want to do with it. You just spend it on useless things, but you, don't, you have no plan of what to do with it. The Lord is saying it's better to give those arms than to lay up gold because they are sitting there, but you don't know what to do with it to do with them. And because of that, guess what? The most I will be able to deal with you to say, okay, you are using the arms that I'm giving you constructively to help your nation. The most I God is looking for stuff like that. Those are the type of speed the Lord is looking for as well. You understand? Go ahead. For arms does deliver from death mm. and shall purge away all sin. Come on. Those that exercise arms and righteousness shall be filled with life. You see what the Bible is saying? It says, if you exercise arms and righteousness, it says you will be filled with life. Because our forefathers gave arms in captivity. You understand? When we're building, rebuilding the temple. Let's get that in Ezra. Okay, let's get that in Ezra real quick. Because I know when it comes to arms, you know, it's a sensitive issue. Me, I don't give a damn about that. The most High God bless us with jobs, nine to fives. So we must what? We must use the arms with the, the, of the sal part of the salaries we, use, we, we need to help each other in this truth. There's older sisters that don't have jobs. We have to help them with food and necessary things. Brothers and sisters that fall short during the month, we assist them. You understand? We need to travel. We need to print flyers, uniforms. There's a whole lot of stuff that is needed. Okay? So watch this. Give me the book of Ezra 1. Ezra chapter 1 and verse 4. This is when Cyrus was the king, 5, 584 BC. Okay, 539 BC, actually. 589 BC on up. Now watch this. Um, read that. Ezra 1 verse 4. Read that. Ezra chapter 1 verse 4. Go ahead. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let mm -hmm. the man of his place help him with silver and with gold Go ahead. and with goods and with beasts beside the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. You see what he's saying? Meaning because our, there are those of our forefathers that did not go back to Jerusalem. They remained in Persia. You understand? Which is majority northern kingdom. Okay? So it says, because you're not going to Jerusalem with your brother, and your brothers to go and build, okay, don't let them go empty-handed. It says what? Your silver, your gold, your goods, your beast, and besides, outside of the free will offering. This is not part of the free will offering. It said outside of that. So that means they gave free will offerings. Not only that, they also gave these type of offerings for the rebuilding of the temple. Okay, go ahead. Jump down then to verse, rose up. No, verse 6. Read verse 6 now. Ezra chapter 1 verse 6. Mm -hmm. And all they that were about them strengthened their hands with vessels of slip of silver, with gold, with goods, and with beasts, and with precious things, beside all that was willingly offered. 
You see that? Be outside of all that was willingly offered. Because the mindset of our forefathers, and they were about building the nation. That's the same mindset that we pushing in soldiers of Christ. Because we must build. You understand? We must build the nation. And the nation is not going to be built on our good looks. No. There's actual things that need to get done which require arms. That's why we always have to collect arms in order for us to do things in the body to progress this congregation. Now watch this. Now give me the book of 2 Kings 22 verse 4. I'm going to show you about our forefather, King Josiah. Okay, this is when King Josiah was the king. Okay, when he was rebuilding as well, having to get rid of the groves and all that. Watch this. 2 Kings chapter 22. Josiah was a righteous king. Okay. 2 Kings chapter 22 verse 4. Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which mm -hmm. the keepers of the door have gathered of the people. You see that? Which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people. So because there was building, just like we are doing today, we rebuild in Jerusalem from the ground up. Okay, go ahead. And let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work. Okay. That have the oversight. I want you, hold on, wait. I want you to see what's going on here. We're rebuilding, right? He says, okay, Hilkiah the priest, he was handling the, 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 the funds that was coming in. So he was recording that what that which came in. He put it all in writing, so bookkeeping. And he also wrote down the, the funds that had to go out to be allocated for the work that needed to be done. So King Josiah, you understand? Hilkiah the high priest, they understood how to do budgets. They understood that. That's why they were able to do what? Read verse 5 again so we get it. Second Kings chapter 22 verse 5. Mm -hmm. And let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work. Wait. That have the oversight of the house of the Lord. Now that goes into what? That goes into the project managers. You know, the officers, the captains, and so forth, that were overseers of the work that needed to get done. Go ahead. And let them give it to the doers of the work which is in the house of the Lord to repair the breaches of the house. That's what we're doing right now. We are repairing the breaches. Go ahead. And to carpenters and builders and masons and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. So they needed to allocate funds. So there was a budget that was put in place, okay? In order for what? The carpenters, how much material they're going to need? Builders, masons, you understand? How much timber we're going to need? So on and so forth in order for what? To rebuild and repair. So they understood budgeting and bookkeeping. They understood them. Capex, OPEX. They understood that stuff. Go ahead. How be it? There was no reckoning made with them of the money that was delivered into their hand because they dealt faithfully. They dealt faithfully with the funds that was coming in. There wasn't covetous. Jump down to verse 9. Second no, no, Kings that, that, chapter 20. Wait, wait, wait. Let me see if that's what I want. Hold on. No, no, that's it on that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Read verse 9. Read verse 9. Second Kings chapter 22, verse 9. Mm -hmm. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have that delivered it in. Read Excuse that part me. again. Thy, thy servants have what? Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house. He says, thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house. So the reason why I have to emphasize this is because some of us, we, we, don't, think, we don't think that big. We don't think, Uri, in order for us to reach Israel, you know, on this side of the earth, we think we're just going to get it done on our, on our good looks. And mm -mm, no, no, that's not going to, that's not, that's, yeah, that's a part of it. But in order for us to move something, Guess what? The Lord is showing us 
historically what our forefathers did in order to get the work done. So in terms of the 30%, in terms of your entertainment, you must also think about that stuff. You understand? You can't just be thinking entertainment, but now we need arms, we need flyers. Where, where's the arms? Okay, the arms, the, the budget for the arms is done already, but it doesn't just magically appear. You understand? As an example. So we need to think about that stuff. Okay, go ahead. Second Kings, chapter 22, verse 9. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, mm -hmm. Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of them that do the work, that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. You see that? Because they understood how they, what in order for them to do this work, they need to have a good handle on the budget. They must understand the expenses that will be required to get this work done. Likewise, we're doing the same thing this day. You understand? Now watch this. Give me the book of Acts, okay? Because I need you men to think about this thing. Sisters as well, but particularly you men. We need to think about this, okay? Give me Acts chapter four. No, no, give me Acts six. Give me Acts six verse one. I'm gonna deal with that. Acts six and one, read that. Acts chapter six verse one. Mm -hmm. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Christians against the Hebrews. Because okay, they are so widows. A, hold on, wait, wait. Uh, read verse one again. Acts chapter six, verse one. Mm -hmm. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Christians against the Hebrews. Wait. Really? Because they are widows when neglected in the daily ministration. Is it their widows was what? They are widows when neglected in the daily ministration. So now what is going on here is that it says the, the Grecians, there was a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. The Grecians is talking about, get that, get me the Zondervan compact. Somebody read that, get the definition of the word Grecians so we see who the Grecians are. That murmured, that murmured against the Hebrews. Let's read that. Okay, you got it? Patience. Uh, I only see Greeks. Uh... Oh, yes, I got it, sir. Okay, all places. Come on. The definition of Christians, according to the Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary, page 207. Mm -hmm. Greece, Gracia, Christians. Gracia is Greece, the home of the Hellenists. Greeks and Gracians, however, are to be distinguished. Greeks okay. are generally those of Hellenic race. No, no, no. Grecian, Grecian. There's Grecian. It says Greek speaking Jews. Just pay attention to what you're reading. Grecians. Grecians were Greek speaking Jews. That folk right of here. the dispersion. So what verse, what part you at? What page are you at? Page 207, sir. Okay, read that part, read it again so we get it. Christians. Mm -hmm. Christians were Greek speaking Jews. You see that? It says Grecians, Greek speaking Jews. Come on, folk of the what? Folk of the dispersion from uh -huh. areas. Predominantly Greek. What verse are they writing in there? Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Uh -huh. and Acts chapter that? 9, verse 29. So the Grecians is the Greek speaking Jews. The Greek speaking Jews. Go back to Acts 6 and 1 now again. The book of Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Read. 
And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a memory of the Grecians against the Hebrews. So now the Grecians is the Greek speaking Jews, meaning Jews that were scattered in, the Jews that were scattered under the Greeks, meaning they were scattered over there during the time of Antiochus and them. Yes, go ahead. Because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So the widows of the Greek speaking Jews, meaning Israelites that grew up in Greek customs, they started to complain against the Hebrews that grew up in Jerusalem. You understand? Because their widows, meaning mothers that their husband had passed and so forth, wives that her husband they had passed, is that they were neglected in the daily ministration. Watch this. Hold this. Give me the book of First Timothy. Let's see um, eligibility for widows that must be taken care of. Watch this. Give me First Timothy chapter 5, okay? First Timothy 5 and verse... Let's start at verse 9. First Timothy chapter 5 verse 9. Mm -hmm. Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man. You see what the Bible is saying? It says a widow that is taken care of, it must be the one that is not, it says, man, it says what? The one that we take must not be what? It says under three score years old, meaning under 60. You see what the Bible is saying? There must be 60 and up, okay? Having been the wife of one man. Okay, go ahead. Well reported of for good works. You see that? So they must have good works in the body. That's the widow's now. Go ahead. If she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. So now these are the, these are the qualities that a widow that must be taken care of, she must meet all these characteristics here. You understand? She must have good name. She must put in the work in Israel and so forth. Like, like for instance, give me that in Luke 236, like our foremother from the tribe of Asher. Let's read that. Luke 236. Luke chapter 2, verse 36. Mm -hmm. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. Really? She was of a great age and had lived with an husband seven years from a virginity. Go ahead. And she was a widow of about four score and four years. So she was 84 years old, right? Which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. You see that? She had good words. She had a good name too. She was called a prophetess. Okay, go ahead. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Meaning what? She was leading people to Christ. You understand? She was talking to the people about Christ that came to Jerusalem. That's 84 years old. She was a widow. So she was well taken care of because she had a good, she had good works, good name in Israel, so on and so forth. So the widows that the, in the book of Acts that are spoken of is the widows that are over 60. Because if they are under 60, now read, by, go back to 1 Timothy 5, read verse 11. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 11. Come on. But the younger widows refuse. But the For younger when... widows, hold on. The younger widows, it says, refuse, meaning what? They must not be part of the what? The, the, the program that we read in Acts 6 and 1, right? But the younger widows refuse. For when they have begun to work wanton against Christ, they will marry. Meaning what? When they start to what? When they start to burn, meaning sexually, because it's, the Lord is saying they are going to begin to burn sexually. He says, that's why it says they begin to work wanton against Christ. They will marry. So meaning what? These younger widows, they must get married. Go ahead. Having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. 
meaning what Christ. Read on. And with all, they learned to be idle, mm -hmm. wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also in busy bodies, speaking things which they ought not. So in, in order to prevent this, they must get married so that they can be under what? They can be under the guide of a man, a lord. You understand? And if they are not, they are not getting remarried yet at that point, they are, will be under the, the guidance of leadership. And for that to happen, we must keep them busy in the body. They must be involved in different offices to keep them busy so that what? They don't wander from house to house causing problems. That's what the Lord is saying right there. Okay, go back to Acts 6 and 1 again. Acts chapter 6 verse 1. Read. Really? And in those days, when the mm. number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a memory of the Christians against the Hebrews because right. their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Read. Really? Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, mm -hmm. It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Come on. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. You see what he's saying? He says, Look ye out among you seven men of honest report full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business. Because the apostles, the 12, they'll say, no, no, we're not going to get involved with that, but we are going to, we need to elect brothers that will be able to deal with this business. You understand? Okay, now watch this. This is what they set up. Get me 2 Maccabees 3 verse 10. This is what the apostles set up, okay? With the seven men that they set up to, uh, that are appointed over this business. I need you men to pay attention. We what you got. Second Maccabees 3 verse 10. Second Maccabees chapter 3 verse 10. Then the high priest told him that there was such money laid up for the relief of widows and fatherless children. Read again. Second Maccabees chapter 3 verse 10. Then the high priest told him that there was such money laid up for the relief Hold of on. widows. Wait, you are reading like you're running somewhere. Come on, read that verse again, verse 10. Second Maccabees, chapter 3, verse 10. Wait. Then the high priest told him that there was such money laid up for the relief. What? That there was such money. That there was such money. There was such money. There was such money that was what? laid up for the relief of widows and fatherless children. So now during the time of the Greeks, our forefathers under the Greeks, you see what they did? What they did is they set up a widow's fund. That's what they set up. They set up a widow's fund. A widow's fund to what, what to relieve the widows, obviously 60 and up and fatherless children. You see that thing? So that's what our forefathers set up during the time of the Greeks. So during the time of Rome and during the time of the Acts of the Apostles, this was neglected. Women, infant, and children. That's the program they set up to deal with the widows and fatherless children. You see that thing right there? So likewise, when you're dealing with that 80%, because I know some of you forgot already in terms of the breaking down of the budget, we forgot that. The Lord is saying we need to set this up to help widows, infants, and children. We're a widow's fund because that was the complaint in the book of Acts. They were complaining about that. You understand? Watch this. Give me Acts now. Chapter 4, verse 34. Here's what they did. Acts, chapter 4, verse 34. Go ahead. Neither was there any among them that lacked. Uh -huh. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold. You see what they did? Our forefathers that had what? He said they, were, they said they were possessors of lands, plural, houses. 
They sold them. They sold the extra houses that they had because that was not a need to have three houses, but it's just you, your wife, and three kids. You don't need four houses. What do you need four houses for? So that's what we're reading here. It says, possessors of land or houses, they sold them, the extra houses they had, and brought the prices of the things that were sold. So they brought the monies to the apostles. Okay, go ahead. And laid them down at the apostles' feet. Mm -hmm. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Including the widows, infants, and children. So that's what he says. They laid them down at the apostles' feet. And what did the apostles do with the, with the, with the prices of the money of the things that were sold? They distributed to the people that needed them. They didn't eat the money. They distributed that money to the people that needed it. That was as distribution was given to every man according as he had need. The pastors don't do that in the church this day. You understand? Even our, our brothers and sisters that have quote unquote money, they don't give a damn about their own people. They are busy buying these lavish, expensive cars and all that. They don't give a damn about their own. They don't care about that. Okay, so letting you know that as a people, we the most that God has given us this book to what to have sense in our head because we've got none. That's what the Lord is telling us right there. So we must get our minds right. You understand? Our forefathers they set this up in captivity, so there's no excuse. Okay, there's no excuse. So we have to set this up. Okay, now watch this. Give me. Mm, Okay, I dealt with this. I dealt with the brothers. Let me deal with the sisters. Okay, give me um, give me First Corinthians seven, verse thirty four. Let's go back there. Let me just touch on on that because I did touch on it, but let me just uh, touch on it again. First Corinthians seven, verse thirty four. We're gonna read thirty four and thirty five. Okay, read that. First Corinthians chapter seven, verse thirty four. Go ahead. There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cared for the things of the Lord oh, that right she may be now, holy. Hold on, wait, wait. He says the unmarried woman cared for the things of the Lord. Now you need you sisters to pay attention. Go ahead. That she may be holy both in body and in spirit. Stop right there. So the unmarried woman cared for the things of the Lord that she may be holy in body and in spirit. Watch this. Give me, jump down to verse 35. Read verse 35 now, because the rest of the verse goes into the sister that's married. Now read verse 35. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 35. Mm -hmm. And this I speak for your own profit. Not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is calmly. And that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. You see that part right there? It says, I speak for your profit because when you are unmarried, your focus must be on doing the work. The men and the women, okay? It says what? That ye may what? That ye may attend upon the Lord without distractions. Because what? The only thing that's supposed to be di distracting you is what? Quote, unquote, is the work of the Lord. The work of the Lord will take you away from the distractions, meaning your lusts, your youthful lusts and so forth. The Lord will, the work of the Lord will prevent you from buying a dildo and so forth. The Lord will, the work of the Lord will prevent you from doing that. Okay, now watch this. Give me the book of, uh, give me the book of First Esdras. Give me First Esdras 4. Give me First Esdras chapter 4. Because I'm going to show you the sisters you understand? In the scriptures, they have, what was their focus? They focus on doing, doing this. First Ezra 4.17, as an example. Watch this. First Ezra, chapter 4, verse 17. Go ahead. These also make garments for men. Mm -hmm. these, these bring glory unto men, and uh -huh. without women cannot men be. You see what it says? These also make garments for men. So sisters, you must le learn how to sew, learn how to make beautiful garments. You understand? That's a beautiful office right there. Okay? 
He says, they make garments for men. These bring glory unto men. You must bring glory to the men of war. You're not married. Guess what? Get involved. Don't sit there be folding your arms. Mm -mm. You must be doing work in Islam. You understand? You give it, we give you the work. Make sure you always keep him busy. Get the work done. Bring evidence of the things that you're doing so that we can be able to give you more things to do. Why? Because it's for your profit. So you don't get distracted by things that you're not supposed to be distracted by. Because I'll give an example. Our foremother, Judith, because her husband was gone. She, her husband was no longer alive. But here's what our foremother, Judith, this is, the example, this is the example that she left behind. Okay? Give me Judith 8, verse 2. Judith, chapter 8, verse 2. Mm -hmm. And Manasseh, and Manasseh was her husband of a tribe and kindred who died in the barley harvest. So Manasseh was her husband. So he died during the barley harvest, right? Now jump down to verse 4. So she was mourning her husband. Okay, Ray. Judith, chapter 8, verse 4. Come on. So Judith was a widow in her house three years and four months. So she was a widow for three years, meaning she was she was mourning her husband for three years and four months. That's when she was mourning her husband. Now, watch this. Jump down to verse six. Read. Judith, chapter eight, you know verse what? six. You know what? Read verse five. Because the reason why I want to bring this out is because today I see the way, you know, our, our sisters let's say their husband passes on and so forth, they, they don't even put on those black dresses anymore to show that they are mourning for their husband. They don't even do that. As soon as the husband dies, guess what they do? They are already in the club. They are already dealing, they are already bumping and grinding on another man's rock. That's what they do. We see it all the time in the play in our communities because it's not communities. These are concentration camps. Okay, now read verse five. Go ahead. Judith, chapter 8, verse 5. Mm -hmm. And she made her a tent upon the top of her house and put on sackcloth upon her loins and wear her widow's apparel. You see that? She put on a widow's apparel. Because in the Bundus, they still do that. I know in Nipopo, we still do that. You understand? Your husband dies, you put on a widow's apparel so people can see. Go ahead. And she fasted all the days of her widowhood save the eaves of the Sabbath and the Sabbath and the eaves of the new moons and the new moon and the feasts and solemn days of the house of Israel. You see what our foremother did? This is the example she left behind. So you can't say, I'm not married. I cannot hold it. Look what our foremother Judith did. She did this. You understand? And remember, she was married and her husband died. So you can't say, okay, but, you know, she never got married before, so she don't know what it's like. No. She was a virgin. She got married to her husband. Her husband passed on. So she understands what it means to deal with a man. Now her husband is dead, is, is gone. Now she's, she's by herself. She's mourning. Obviously, after she, the, the, her mourning period was done, she didn't get remarried. Okay, that's what the choice she made. But the point is, you see how she kept herself in the spirit? You see how she made sure that she was always in the spirit? She didn't get himself in gossip and all that. He said she fasted all the days of a widowhood. So what was the days of a widowhood? Three years and four months. So it says, except the eaves of the Sabbath, meaning what? On Friday, obviously she broke the fast Thursday night. So that Friday, because she'll be preparing for the Sabbath and so forth. It says, and the Sabbath, she wasn't fasting on the Sabbath. And the eaves of the new moons, meaning what? the day before the new moon began because she needs to do preparations and the feast of the new moon itself, she didn't fast and the feast and the solemn days of the house of all the, the high holidays that was given, she didn't fast. But so on average, how many days did she fast a week? Five days a week. That's how, she, that's how long she fasted. That's why the book of Judith is written in. To give you sisters so that the sisters don't have escape goals. So sisters don't have excuses. You see that thing? That's how you keep yourself pure from all sins with men. Because that's the number one thing. Sisters be getting horny and so forth. 
Yeah, that we're keeping it 100, as always. Now, the point is, this is how you make sure that you stay in spirit. The sisters that are unmarried. You understand? Okay. All praises to the Lord. Now, moving on. Now, I want to deal with debt. Okay? Debt. Dealing with debt. Dealing with debt. Now, watch this. Because this is still part of budget. As you are doing your budget, you understand? You've got debts that you need to pay and so forth. Okay? Don't forget, you deal with your needs. You deal with the savings that you must put away. You also must deal with... You know what? Hmm. Let me do a step back because you know what that part right there of the savings right i didn't really i don't think i went deep into it let me touch on it right so what we read in i'm just gonna mention like this what we read in genesis 41 with our forefather joseph okay our forefather joseph let's just read it read it so we can um so i can just i explain it Watch this. Get Genesis 41. I just want to touch on something. Something just dawned. Um, Genesis 41. Watch this. Genesis 41 and verse... Read verse 34. Genesis 41, 34. Genesis chapter 41, verse 34. Go ahead. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land mm -hmm. and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. So that's the 20%. So now, watch this. The 20% that, you, that you're that going to be putting away, because it does. you can put more if you can. So think about this here. This is emergency fund, like we're reading on the Standard Bank website. It's emergency fund and so forth, right? That emergency fund is going to help you, let's say, in case you lose a job, you understand? Whatever happens where you find yourself you cannot get income anymore, both men and women. So I remember I used to work with this guy, some German dude, and he told me that how he does his savings, right? He, he always has savings that if he loses a job, he will be able to survive uh, for six to 12 months. So which means that he saved up money, he saved up, money that if he loses a job it will be as though he's still getting his salary you understand so that's these are things we need to think about like our forefather joseph did here during the time of uh, um the egypt egypt so while you still have your salary coming in and so forth like the during the time of egypt there was seven years of plenty so during the seven years of plenty Meaning during the time when you you still salary is still coming, you still have a lot of um, surplus that is left after you do your budget and so forth. Listen, put that money away. Don't be spending on things that you don't need to. And obviously separate out of that for arms and things that needs to be done in, in Israel. But the point is, you need to be able to put that money away. But that takes discipline. It's not going to fall on your lap. It takes discipline for you to get to a level where you can be comfortable and say, if I were to lose a job or anything happened, you understand, my wife loses a job, whatever the case may be, I'll be able to continue carrying the family expenses as though both of us are still working because I put away funds that is equivalent to my salary. Obviously, that will take time to accumulate that. Maybe every two or three months, you'll be able to gather your salary. Then the three months will make one month for one month salary. Then three months, another one month, three months, because it took seven years for Joseph to do this. So we can do it. Definitely. There's no if or maybe it can be done. Okay, I just wanted to touch on that because I didn't explain that. Okay, now let's deal with let's deal with debt. Give me Proverbs 22, 7. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. Watch this. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. Go ahead. The rich rules over the poor, mm -hmm. and the borrower is servant to the lender. You see that? The rich rules over the poor. Because we the poor. Get that in Isaiah 14, the last verse. Let's see who the poor is. The rich rules over the poor. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 32. Read. 
What shall one then answer the messengers of the nation that the Lord has founded Zion and the poor mm. of his people shall trust in it? So you see, the poor is Zion. The poor is not talking about white people or Chinese people that we see on the earth, the robots with the small board saying, I'm looking for work. No, geez, they are not the poor. We are the poor. Okay. Go back to Proverbs now, 22 verse 7. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 7. Read. The rich ruleth over the poor, mm -hmm. and the borrower is servant to the lender. You see that? The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is a servant to the lender. So we the poor, you understand? And we are the servant to the, the nations that are lending us money. Get the book of Deuteronomy 28. You know what? Give me Revelation 2 verse 9. Revelation 2 verse 9. Give me that. Revelation chapter 2, verse 9. Go ahead. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. Come on. But thou art rich. Mm -hmm. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So Christ is telling us, he says, I know your works and tribulation and poverty. So Christ is telling us, say, listen, I, I know the works that you're putting in in Israel, and I see the troubles that you go through while putting in the work. Then it says, and I understand I know your poverty because we're impoverished, we're in slavery, but we're trying. Okay, go ahead. It says, but thou art rich because the promises in the Bible is promised to us. It was it's all made for us. Now give me to Tommy 28 verse 43 now. You understand? Because this is part of the curses that we're going through. Because the nations have a head start. They've got old money. That old money comes from what? It comes from it's slave money. Because when, when during the time of the Spanish Inquisition, the Portuguese Inquisition, when we were the Moors ruling in Spain and Portugal, we was rich. When they came to Spain and Portugal, when we were ruling as the Moors, they robbed us. They took our gold, our silver, our precious, everything. So they used the money that they robbed us from the silver and the gold to fund the transatlantic slave trade. Okay, get that in, um, get that, Deuteronomy 28 verse 43, read that. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 43. Come on. The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high mm -hmm. and thou shalt come down very low. And that's exactly where we are now. Come on, next verse. He shall learn to thee, mm -hmm. and thou shalt not learn to him. You see that? We it says he, the stranger, will learn to us, and we will not learn to them. That's what we read in Proverbs when it says, the what? It says the borrower is a servant to the lender. Go ahead. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. So that's the conditions we find ourselves in. But because of the mercy of the Lord, we are able to get jobs, so that we can be faithful with the little that the Lord is giving up to us. You understand? For great is our reward in heaven. Now, let's, let's, let's deal with um, debt. Let me share my screen. Okay. Let me share my screen real quick. Okay. Now. Okay. I need you to read that. Dead avalanche versus dead no. snowball. So where are you reading from? Reading from investopedia.com. Uh -huh. Dead avalanche versus dead snowball. What's the difference? So now, this right here, they are giving us two different techniques in terms of two different types of deaths and how to deal with them. So there's two different types. There's the one is called dead avalanche. The other one is called, is called dead snowball. So we're going to see the difference between the two. Okay, now read that. Dead avalanche versus dead snowball, an overview. Mm -hmm. Come on. Paying off debt is, not, is no easy task. Go ahead. Especially if you just pay the minimum amount due each month. 
Mm -hmm. To get free and clear, you often have to accelerate payments. There are two distinct strategies to settle outstanding balances in this way. The debt avalanche method and the debt snowball method. So now there's two methods of paying debt, of dealing with your debt, right? The debt avalanche and the debt snowball. Okay, so let's read that. Both the debt avalanche, come on. Both debt avalanche and debt snowball apply to most kinds of consumer debts, personal, student, and auto loans, credit card balances, medical bills. Come on. They do not work with and shouldn't be tried with mortgage repayments. Mm -hmm. really? Each method requires that you list out your debts and make minimum payments on all but one of them. Mm, come on. That one, that one you pay extra money towards with the aim of wiping it out first. Once it's erased, you target another balance. The extra money you apply towards, it could be the minimum sum you had to pay on the erased debt. So now what they are explaining to us here is what? They are explaining to us that, okay, you, what, you, what you need to do is as each method requires, you, you have to list your debt. So you must be able to do a consolidation of your debt to see, okay, how much do I owe on each debt and what is the interest rate on each debt? Okay, and make, many, make minima, minimum payments on all but one of them. So now it says, now he's not giving us the difference between the debt avalanche or the snowball, uh, the snowball method. So I'm gonna go to each one individually. Okay, so small explanations, nothing hectic here. Debt avalanche, let's deal with that first. Okay, read that. Debt avalanche. Mm -hmm. The debt avalanche method involves making minimum payments on all your outstanding accounts, then using any of the remaining money earmarked for your debts to pay off the bill with the highest interest rate. Mm -hmm. Using the debt avalanche method will save you the most in interest payments. So now what we're reading here is the debt, the debt avalanche is that obviously you list all your debts. You start with the one with the highest interest rate and then you go down the list with the least interest rates. So you kill the, the big one first while maintaining the rest of the debts that you have with minimum repayments. You understand? That's the debt avalanche method. Now, uh, this one says using the debt avalanche method will save you the most interest, um, most in interest payments. Watch this, because you're starting with the with the bigger one first, you understand, to kill that off while still maintaining the rest of the your repayments on the other debts or loans that you've got. Okay, now let's see. Okay, that's what I want. Read that. The pros and cons. Let's start with the pros for the of the debt avalanche. Read that. The pros of debt avalanche. Pros. Minimizes the amount of interest you pay. Mm -hmm. Come on. Lessens the amount of time it takes to get out of debt. So now this one, is the, because the, when you, the more you pay, obviously the less interest you're going to end up paying going forward and you will finish your debt quick. The cons. Let's read them. The cons of debt avalanche takes discipline and commitment to pull off. So this one requires discipline to, you understand? To achieve this one, it says it takes a lot of discipline. Okay, come on. It requires constant amount of discretionary income. So you need to have like some extra money to be able to deal with this one. You understand? So when you look at us as a nation, I mean, we don't have that. You understand? Watch this. Now let's deal with the snowball, the debt snowball method. Read that. Debt snowball. The debt snowball method involves paying off the smallest debts first to get them out of the way before moving on to bigger ones. Kind of a tackle the easy job first approach. You see that? So with this one, you, you list all your debts, you understand? And then regardless of their interest rates, but you look at the actual amounts that are owed on each debt. 
So you start with the one which, which, what, which has the lesser amount. You move on to, big, to the bigger ones as time goes. Let's say you owe a thousand bucks on this one, and then you owe 1,200 on this other one and 1,500 on the other. You start with the 1,001 while maintaining payments, minimum payments on the 1,200 and the 1,500 one. But on the minimum one, you kill that one off first, but you don't neglect the, the remaining. That's what this goes into. Okay, go ahead. You make a list of all the outstanding amounts you owe in ascending order of size. You target the first one to pay off first, putting as much extra money into each payment as you can afford. You see that? Go ahead. The others you pay just the minimum on. When the mm -hmm. first debt is settled, then you target the next smallest one for the extra payment treatment. Because now you no longer have that extra payment because you kill, you kill the first one. Now you have extra in, you have extra pocket money that you can redirect to the next one on the list. That's what this is going into. Okay, let's go to the pros and cons. Okay, read that. Pros of snowball method. Mm -hmm. Builds motivation by settling debts fast. So now because you are starting small, you are gradually growing, you are, you are, you are, building, you are building up to deal with the bigger debt. Okay, come on. Easy to implement. It's easy to implement this one. Okay, let's look at the cons. The cons of snowball method. Incurs more interest, more expensive overall. Meaning in the long run, it's going to be more expensive because you're not, you don't have that lump sum to be killing off these debts that you've got, like the avalanche. The avalanche requires you to have extra extra moolah. You understand? Go ahead. Can take longer to become completely debt free. He's not saying it's impossible. He says it's, it's going to take longer. So with this one, this one requires patience. This one requires patience. Give me the book of Luke. Okay, give me Luke 21. Give me Luke chapter 21 and verse 19. Read that. Luke chapter 21, verse 19. Come on. In your patience, possess ye your souls. You see that? In your patience, possess ye your soul. Sarah 17. Okay, let's get there. Sarah 17, verse 20. In your patience, possess ye your soul. So we need patience here. Yeah. Okay, Sarah 17, verse 32. Verse 32. Let's read it. Ecclesiasticus. Chapter 17, verse 32. Come on. He viewed the power of the height of heaven. Hold on, wait. And wait, all wait. men. No, no, no. No, 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 no. That's not what I want. Sarah 20, verse 32. I'm sorry. Sarah 20, verse 32. That's what I want right there. Ecclesiasticus, chapter 20, verse 32. Come on. Necessary patience in seeking the Lord is better than he that leadeth his life without a guide. You see that? Necessary patience. So the Lord is teaching us that patience is necessary in order for us to achieve the goals that we set, in order for us to, to have a, um, a healthy financial life. Because in order for you to have a healthy lifestyle, whether you exercise and so forth, we also need to have financial health. That's very important as well. It's all part of repentance, financial health. You understand? So, because I'm, we're in captivity, we, we're paying for everything. Everything is the cost. So, in our situation, you need to be patient in dealing with debt. You understand? You need to be patient because if you do, because I'm not saying you cannot deal, you cannot do the avalanche one. If you can, obviously you can do it. But the majority of Israel, us, we, we definitely deal with the, the snowball one. It's easier for us because of the amount of um, monies that we get from the slave master and so forth. You understand? So now watch this. Let's see what the Lord has to say. Which method does the Lord recommend for us? Watch this. Give me Luke. Let's give me Luke 16, verse 1. We're going to read a parable. Okay, pay attention. Okay, read that. Luke 16 and 1. 
Luke chapter 16, verse 1. Come on. And he said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. So now you had a steward that had a job, and now he is accused of wasting the master's goods. You understand? Really? I mean, this is an employee working for a CEO or whatever. Okay, come on. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou, mm -hmm. may, for thou mayest be no longer steward. You see what he's saying? He said, listen, what is this thing that I'm hearing of you? That you'll be wasting the goods of the company and so forth? So now he's, 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 he's now, guess what? He's been fired. Okay, read that part again, verse 2. Luke chapter 16, verse 2. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. You see what he said now? I mean, he's on the verge of losing his job, basically. That's what's going on. Go ahead, verse 3. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig to beg, I am ashamed. You see what he's saying? He said, now he's thinking within himself, say, what am I going to do? How am I going to solve this problem? Because I don't want to lose my job. Why, watch what he does. Go ahead. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So now he's saying, listen, okay. So if I'm put out of the stewardship, I'm fired. You understand? It says, the people, because remember, this man, his job was to do what? Because he, he worked for his boss. So he needed to be able to do the work that he was hired to do. So now he's thinking, well, like, if I get put out, the, is the people going to be able to receive me into the houses? Because, uh, by the way, this is a deeper parable, but I'm showing you in the context of the class that's coming out. Keep reading. Go ahead. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first. Wait, wait, hold on. So you see what, this is the plan that he came up with. So he says he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him. Meaning what? Everybody that owed his boss. He said, okay, this is how I'm going to solve the problem. Everybody that owes my boss, I'm going to call them up. Read. And said unto the first, how much owest thou unto my Lord? He said, how much do you owe my boss? Okay. He's calling them. This is what, this, that's where Esau get the business of debt collection from. You see, Esau's not smart. The white man is not smart. All these businesses, they start, listen, they read the Bible. They read our book. They make, Esau just exploits everything. Everything is just a weapon. He weaponizes every idea. That's what we saw in the matrix that we was watching, right? Okay. Read that again. Verse five. Luke chapter 16, verse 5. Come on. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and uh -huh. said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? Go ahead. And he said, An hundred matches of oil. Mm -hmm. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and sit down quickly and write 50. He says, Okay, you owe 100 measures of oil, no problem. Guess what? Pay half of that. Just pay half of the hundred, get right fifty. Just pay fifty. Okay, go ahead. Then said he to another, and how much owest thou? And he said, and hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write four score. Meaning eighty. Because guess what? Wheat, obviously, wheat is 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 is, is more weighty in terms of value and so forth. So he's saying, listen, um, pay eighty. That, that's, that's what four score is, 80. Go ahead. And the Lord commanded the unjust steward because right he had there. done wisely. Hold on. The Lord did what? The Lord commanded the unjust steward. So it says the Lord commanded this unjust steward because he was unjust. But it says the Lord commanded him. Because what did he do? He, he, 
I mean, he, he didn't get his boss, all the money from the people that they owe his boss, but he managed to what, you know what? You owe this much, no problem. You don't have to pay everything. Just pay half. You can pay 80% of that. You can, you understand like that. So he was, he was going to all these people that owe his boss to say, whatever you can afford to pay, give it to me. Give like that, you understand? And he collected all of that and he brought that money to his boss. So what did, what did the Lord do? Verse 8 again. Luke chapter 16, verse 8. Come on. And the Lord commanded the unjust steward because he had done wisely. You see that? He did, he did well. He did well. Go ahead. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. You see that? Because guess what? He's an unjust steward. That's why even in the world, our brothers and sisters, they know how to handle budget. Many of them, they know how to. But in Israel, there's a problem. So that means something wrong. We need to fix that. So what is Christ teaching us? Christ is teaching this, what he's saying. Give me that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 31. This is really what Christ is teaching us, which is what the apostle Paul said here. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 31. Watch this. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 31. Come on. And they that use this world as not mm -hmm. abusing it. Come on. For the fashion of this world passes away. You see what, you see what the apostle said? Is this, and they that use this world and as not abusing it. So what is the Lord teaching us? He says, you must use this world. How? Don't use it, but don't abuse it. Meaning what? Don't do unjust things that are against the law in the, in the name of I'm using the world because the Lord said that. No. The law says, use it, but don't abuse it. Meaning, don't break God's commandments in order for you to benefit from this world. That's what he's saying. So, meaning what? There's different videos on YouTube that you can watch on how to do budget, so on and so forth as an example, right? So, what we're reading in Luke 16, which, which method did, did this brother um, employ and he was commended by Christ for it? He used the snowball method. You see the method he used? Do you see that, brothers? Yes, sir. Hello? Do you see that? Oh, yes, praise sir. sir. I need you men to pay attention, sisters as well. So he used the snowball method. So this snowball method that you see Esau be coming up with, he didn't come up with it. Okay? The white man is not that smart. Okay? Read that again. Go back to Luke 16, verse 8. Luke chapter 16, verse 8. Come on. And the Lord commanded the unjust steward because he had done wisely. Mm -hmm. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Next verse. Watch this. Come on. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Come on. That when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. You see, what the, you see what Christ said? He said, listen, he's saying what the Apostle Paul said, because the Apostle Paul gets it from here. They that use this world as not abusing it. That's what Christ is saying. He says, I, and I say unto you, because of this unjust steward, this unjust steward wasn't keeping the commandments, but guess what? He found a solution for his boss. So guess what? Here it says, the Lord commanded, no, no, verse 9 says, and I say unto you, Make to yourself friends of the memon of unrighteousness. Meaning what? Acquaintances in the world. Because you're dealing right according to the scriptures. You understand? So that, so that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitation. Because you might find yourself that, you understand? There's a, let's say, there's the, I'll, I'll give an example. Um... There was a brother that used to transport us, you know, and obviously he's no longer around because I think he's, he's back to Limpopo for now. But we, we had a build a very good relationship, you understand? So sometimes, obviously, things go bad. And I would say, listen, I, we still need to go to camp. He said, no, no, but you always we deal right with each other. I'll drop you. I'll come and pick you up too. So why? Because of what? Because of righteous dealings. We deal rightly. That's what the Lord is explaining here. You understand? So in terms of debt, 
Listen, the most that God has given us the solutions to come out of it. You might not do it like Speedy Gonzalez, but guess what? You can use the, 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 the solution that the Lord has provided here in Luke 16 in order for you to deal with the debt. You understand? Now watch this. Give me, okay, give me the book of Hebrews. Give me Hebrews 11. Watch this. You know what? Hmm. Give me John 2. Give me John 2.22. I like that verse right there. Give me John 2.22. I'm almost done. John 2 verse 22. Watch this. John chapter 2 verse 22. Go ahead. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. And they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had said. You see that? They believed the scripture. They believed the scripture and the word which Jesus has said. So we must believe what the scriptures say. They're because the scriptures is the foundation. I need each and every one to understand that thing. The scriptures is the foundation. You understand? So I'm going to end the class right there. All right? In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I'm going to end the class right there. Let's break bread. Okay? Let's break bread. I'm going to end the class right there. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed to pray, and when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take it, this is my body which is broken for you. These do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. These do ye as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as they eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. In the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 